Right. Has anybody not got a badge? Yeah, right. And you're here for the UCAS conference. No, yeah, fine. Just making sure. Right. Has anybody not got a badge? Right. You can be the you can Anybody else got a Okay. Should we, should we get going? If I do the intro, then you're on. Is it going to be seen? Right. Right. Um, I guess. My name's James. A lot of you not going to have a bad all of you have met me. Um, and I myself and I have been trying to organize this UCAP conference for seven years. Yeah, last time I said. Um, apologies for the cryptic way of getting in. I mean, that's sort of half the challenge. Um, I'm not doing a talk about the house, but I'll be introducing the talk. Okay. Um, but also, the other thing to write, you've got your badges. Should we, should we get going? Um, Morning, I'm going to be a load of 
to that point. Yeah, 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 the future of what they have been having the plans, the ideas. I haven't really written an agenda because there's not that many people. We've been working on that. 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 We've been working on so we're recording as well. So the YouTube research. So I guess I'll get right into it. The main reason we want to cut down system on your launch, well, your main reason you want one on your launch is to stop something like this from happening. Well, I'm sure some, some people here experience that. I know um, Cusif has had that happen quite a few times, so has Dave. Um, well, like you do all the calculation, you try and get your neck lift exactly right. And, but occasionally something goes wrong, you get a, use a Chinese balloon which doesn't burst properly or who knows what, and your payload ends up either in the water or on the other side of the country, in the middle of a large city, like somewhere around there perhaps, <laughs> or it lands in the middle of a conservation park with no access tracks. Yeah, this is the one that we have big problems with in Australia. So the real solution to this kind of problem is to actually not, is to add a few extra stirks of gas uh, to your um, balloon when you're filling. But just in case, just in case something goes wrong, or for example, you decide it's time to go home, this thing's been up in the air for too long, let's cut it down. Well, it's nice to have something there so you can do it. So cut down to nothing new. Um, 
I think Hank Cussell from Use One had, had flown them before. Uh, Dave's flown one. Um, in, in, ignited in the back of his car. Um, so that was interesting. And so far, they've mostly been triggered by either a timeout, so four hours and leave it, they cut it down, or a GPS fence, attitude fence, so on and so forth. That's where it gets parked at a certain location, or gets parked at a certain altitude, and it fires the cut down, and away you go. I think someone has done a ground based cut down before. Because they've had an uplink system going at one point, I think. So, and to be honest, I don't really like automated cut downs at all. Um, I prefer to have the option to trigger it when I want it to be triggered from the ground. And so this is how we actually um, mechanically do <coughs> cut down um, on a regular <coughs> spots. Our cut down payload isn't the same payload as the, as the telemetry payload. Have a think about how you would actually deal with keeping a parachute on the line, having the micro wire be somewhere near the payload, and stop the parachute from tangling away, tangling with your um, uh, balloon train lines. It's really difficult to do, and we tried that. I tried that uh, two weeks ago now, and the whole thing just tangled up and didn't really work very well. So for the, for the, for the most part, our cut down payloads are actually separate. They sit above the parachute, just below the balloon. So it's a completely separate payload. Of course, you can turn it upside down, use it for dropping things, like <laughs> Teddy there. Um, we were going to do this, but we had some problems, which I'll talk about later on. Uh, and it never ended up happening, unfortunately. Ted ended up, Ted ended up landing on someone's car. You may have seen the pictures. Uh, they're, they're on Dave's. It's perfect. You find it. The owner of the car thought it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was um, hanging over the side of the car, facing the door. Facing his front door. So the guy will open the door and look at his car and went. I stood on the way over the door and said, I seem to have got this in my car. Yeah, it was pretty good. So, for, so everyone's. Everyone's done. We know we all know about downlinks and balloons. We've got NTX twos. There haven't really been many um, uplinks that have been used. There are ways of doing it. For example, you might know there's a paired receiver module of the NTX two the NRX. Uh, that's that's pretty much an FM receiver is what you can use it as. So you could feed the output of that into a DTMF decoder, and voila, you've got some kind of uplink system. Problem is those are are locked to a certain frequency. It's very hard to change them. So I think it was about six months ago or so, uh, word about uh, a new, well not really that new, but an alternative uh, telemetry board uh, went around uh, UK, UK has, and that's the RFM 22B. And that looks a bit familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> On your badge, you've got a footprint for an RFM 22B. So you can with a bit of SMD soldering, which is always fun, it's good to learn. Um, you can add one of these to your badge and use it to play around with, uh, play around with this particular device. So the really cool thing about the RFM chip, RFM board is we want to refer to it as from now on, it's frequency agile. You can tune this across the entire amateur 70 centimeter band, including the entire ISM band. So no worries about clash, frequency clashes, just change the line of code, really neat. Variable output power. So around here, you'd want to use 10 milliwatts if you want to uh, keep within the law. But if you're going elsewhere, or say when it hits the ground, um, and you can suddenly refer to it as an amateur station, because it's on the ground, not everyone, you could, you could raise the transmit power. In Australia, of course, we, we can do 25 milliwatts. So it's nice to be able to up the transmit power a bit. It's a transceiver. This is the most important part. It can receive packets, which is really, really cool. I'll get more into that a little bit later on. Best point about it is it's really, really cheap. So from Anthony's store, it's seven pounds. The NTX2 is 19 pounds. And the only other frequency agile transmitter, for example, the frequency agile version of the NTX2 is about 40 pounds, I believe. So this is a much better option, or in terms of cost anyway. There are problems. Just like the NTX2, it drifts in frequency. Look at that little crystal, it's tiny. It's got no, th it's got no mass at all. Temperature changes, the output frequency drifts. It doesn't drift as much as the NTX2 though. Uh, it, I've seen it drift by about three kilohertz over the course of a flight. That's not so bad. You can't use it like an NTX2 where you can play on the voltage levels and do really, really narrow shifts on your transmission. You've got, yeah, it's all done digitally. You have to program it by SPI. Um, and you've got a 100 hertz minimum shift. And because it's programmed by SPI, it's really complicated to use. There are libraries out there. Uh, James has written kind of a compressed one as well. 
the library that I use, which is the one that you search, one that you find when you Google IRPM 22B Arduino, um, that takes up 10 kilobytes of space on the ABR. It's really, really big, uh, but it works, and it works well enough for what I'm doing. So, what can it do? Well, the chip isn't designed for RITI, uh, not at all. Um, it, well, RITI as we know it. It's meant to do um, on-off keying, FSK and GFSK, so the Gaussian frequency shift keying, and it can do really, really fast data rates. So 256 kilobore, that's not really going to work at, with 10 milliwatts output power from a balloon. So for the downlink, is actually a constant carrier mode. So you switch it into this mode, it just broadcasts a carrier, and there's a little register which you can twiddle bits on it and it changes the output frequency in hyperhertz steps. With that, you can do frequency shift key, you can do RITI. Uh, so for the downlink, I always use RITI. I don't bother with any of these fancy data modes for downlink. Um, so for um, the uplink, I'm using 500 board GFS cache. Now, the data sheet says that the chip should be able to operate down to 123 board. It doesn't. It actually cut it, it um, stops working below 500 boards. That's the minimum data rate that it can use to that it can receive at. So, uh, the packets um, we can send quite a lot of data through, uh, 256 bytes, uh, and it does. And all the preamble header and CRC is all done internally. So, what happens is when it receives a packet, it checks the it checks the CRC, and it only tells the microcontroller if the CRC matches. So when you get a message from the chip saying, yes, I've got a packet for you, you know it's a valid packet, which is really useful. Um, so this is what, uh, this is kind of a, a spectrogram um, off of, not Apple Digi, but similar program of the downlink from uh, my payload here. So what the way I um, run it is I transmit a ready sentence, which can be decoded in DL Apple Digi, and then I transmit a short GFSK, that should be GFSK, not GMSK, sorry. A short GFSK packet which just says ready. Now, the purpose of that is that later on down the track, I want to have something on the ground which listens for that packet and then replies to it. That isn't there yet, but it's getting there. Then it listens for five seconds. During that time, I can send packets from the ground. If it receives a packet, it'll act on. And I'll show you how that works later on. Something you can see here as well. So this is um, a frequency scale is vertical. You'll see that the entire signal, including the 500 board GFSK signal, fits within a 3 kilohertz bandwidth channel. This is really, really important. I'll get to that a little bit later on. So, what do we actually do on the ground? How do we talk uh, to our payloads in the air? So, we can use another RFM 22B, but our link budget um, on our radio path is it's pretty marginal. Uh, so, uh, for a 40 kilometer path at 434 megahertz, there's 115 dB of path loss. We can make up some of that by using high gain antennas. So, for example, on the ground, we could use a very long yard antenna. Uh, or we can up the power. So, you could put an amplifier on the output of it. Uh, you could try running it at 100 milliwatts. It may work. The whole point is that you receive signal at the payload that needs to be higher than the noise floor. So, what I've measured in the past in Australia using a linear regulator to power the entire device is a noise floor of negative 105 dBm. I don't know if that means much to anyone here, but it's quite low. Then I made a board with a boost converter, and I did it wrong, and the noise floor was negative 80 dBm. So what that means is it's a hell of a lot harder to actually get a packet to it. So we found that out. Um, on the last flight, I think where we flew this payload here, that we needed a fair bit of power to be able to get to the um, balloon, uh, to, be to, for it to be able to receive packets. Uh, I could not contact it with another RFM 22B, so that's something to watch out for. Uh, while, the, while the downlink frequency does drift, well, of course the receive frequency drifts as well, the RFM 22B has internal frequency correction, which is really nice. So when you transmit, uh, it'll, it, when you send it, you can send a preamble, so it's a, uh, a couple of bytes long, like just zeros and ones, uh, one zero, one zero, whatever, and it locks onto that, tunes the receiver, and it works really, really well. So here we can see, I've got, uh, this is a bit complicated, but you can see on the left there where it's transmitting, I'm sending a packet through, it's responding, so it sends an act and it goes, doo -doo 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 -doo, transmits again. Now it's another packet, which is at a lower frequency, or sorry, higher frequency in this case, 
it still receives it. Lower frequency, still receives it. Even lower frequency, still receives it. You can be off by up to 10 kilohertz and it's still receiving packets, which is really, really nice. As I was saying before, these packets do fit within a 3 kilohertz channel, which is the same received bandwidth as your generic amateur radio sideband receivers. Well, we do, a re do basically do a replay attack. Not really an attack, but you could do that. Um, so I recorded packets uh, transmitted and played them back at a higher power. And it works really, really well. Because they fit within that 3 kilohertz bandwidth, it just works perfectly. So here you can see me sitting in the back of a car, laptop, and I'm just playing a bloody wave file using Audacity. Uh, yeah, that was really weird. You missed that. Sorry. This person will go there. Um, and I've got a radio on the side there, and I'm transmitting through that, and the payload receives it. So I don't know if this is going to work. You can't hear it. But we've got, um, we can plug things in. There we go. That's what it sounds like. You may have heard that on the last slide if you're listening to the million heart payload. So now I'm going to tempt fate and see if I can get this working live. <coughs> so, give me just a minute, I'll show you how I can transmit to the payload from another, I'll actually use another rpm 22 b as the example. So, that's transmitting. Could I get a volunteer from the audience to hold up that payload? <laughs> No, no, I don't use pyros. Pyros are illegal in Australia. I have to use an iPhone wire. Anyone? I'll hold one. I'll hold it. Oh, we might just have the cost of the check. I don't want to hold this. Uh, so you hold it from the string. Yep, that will do. I should trust an Australian guy. Yeah, well, I'll just trust me. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. That's the. I think that's New Zealand. It's going to blow it out. Right. So if you just move off to the side a little bit, that'll be great. This is just something that I've been playing with. This is pretty much my debug console on the um, which which works on the badge and works on a few different boards. I'm going to be releasing the source code to this so you can play around with the RFM 22B and see what happens. So it's a bit hard to do it over here, but. Um, Right, I've just changed the frequency. What I'm going to do is change the output power. You didn't see that power level, by the way. <laughs> okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the message which I'm going to send. So I'm going to send it a, what's called, basically a ping packet. <coughs> so, what I've got here is I'm going to send it a packet. So, I don't know if you can quite see that there. The packet is very simple, dollar sign, zero, space, something, doesn't matter what it is. Dollar sign is basically tells the payload that this is, this is a command. The next character is the command number. Really, really simple, really, really insecure. Then, and now I'm going to have to put in some kind of security now that you guys know how these things, know how it works. <laughs> Otherwise you'll be able to cut down people's payloads. Um, that's not, that's, I do that, that's very not, not a very nice thing to do. So now I'm going to this mode. So you can see it transmitting. Send. Voila, right. that's got a packet. So, let's try something else. I'm going to change the message. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you the coding at the same time as I do this, but um, it is sending ready, it's sending 300 board ready. Uh, Right. Yeah. This means going to cut down there. <laughs> so, of course, when you're dealing with this, you have to wait for the um, gap to be able to send the command. Okay, it's gotten that command. Now, let's see if this works. It gets it wrong. Your arm will Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't get it wrong, my arm will This is going to happen. Now, let's see if this works. This string is too <laughs> So, if I was doing that um, the way I was, the way I would I'd do, I'd do it in a car, each of those packets that I was sending are already pre-recorded. Um, they sound like what you heard, what you would have heard before. 
Um, and let's bring this back up. And it, it takes a bit of time to do it. It really does take time. It's you have to sit down, stop the car, work out what's going on, send the command, away you go. So that, that's dropped the payload from the balloon now. Yes. Yeah? So so you, so the payload's now on the parachute coming down. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. What's happening to the balloon? Floating away. Um, it will go up a lot quicker now and burst because you've got no no. Oh, right. right. So, so, just, so yeah. we don't care about the balloon anymore. Now, what another thing, another cool trick that you can do with the cut down is if, even if you don't fire the cut down, you know when you when the balloon bursts, sometimes it doesn't burst cleanly. You get all sorts of latex and crap flying down with you. After it's burst, fire the cut down. The balloon goes away. Imagine someone's field, you don't care about it anymore. <laughs> it's a bit easier in Australia if it lands on a field, no one will find it ever. <laughs> <laughs> so it it's pretty it would, tedious. It would degrade. It will break down, so yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it is a bit, it's a bit concerning, it's a bit annoying to get to, to run it, but it does work. Um, so where am I going next with this? Well, that. <laughs> Um, it's not hard to do. Pretty much, uh, when I, as soon as I get back to Australia, uh, this board, which you see, is a badge with a lot of stuff on it, and I've hacked, hacked up a uh, FTDI adapter. That's going to go inside of a box and have a power amplifier attached to it. That'll attach to some any antenna, a couple of dials, big red button, set the dials, press the button, payload cuts away, and it will work very well. Any questions? What was the cut down made in? Just microwave wire? Microwave wire. Uh, well, you can see it in the afternoon. I'll be doing a. I will have it sitting at the back somewhere. Like when I was doing anything, like coating it with something. The glue or something. Uh, the coating was most likely melted plastic from the previous launch. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Do you have feedback? On the system to say that the cutters work, it was yes. coming down like a bucket of bricks. Uh, there is well, so what happens is after the cut down fires, before it turns the FET off, which drives the micro wire, it measures the battery voltage. So if you see the battery voltage drop down significantly, it means the micro wire is running. Now that is a problem. You can't tell without firing the firing the micro wire whether the micro wire is still there or not. Um, that's something that's going in the next version, which is a constant current driver. Uh, which will tell us, you can see whether the micro wire still exists or not. Um, that's something that needs to be added because this is a very, very simplistic way of doing things. Any other questions? No? Next Great. speaker, we're ahead of schedule. I think we're ahead of schedule. While Ed's setting up, I'll just talk about um, this. One of the other things we've thought about, and we can talk about this later on today, is that. So. I don't know where the music's coming from. Um, all right, great. Never mind. Okay, carry on. Um, which has been interfered with their wireless. <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, it must be a graduation or something. I don't know. Never mind. Um, everyone's got a badge now with potentially an uplink system. So I wonder whether, you know, we've got a downlink system we've created, a network that works across the UK, works very well. Oops. Um, whether we can make an uplink system as well. Now there are legal issues about, you know, power outputs and things like that, and that's one of the things that we can talk about later about, you know, what, can we basically discussion from the list about what, what is allowed, what's not allowed, do you need a license, do you not need a license. But I'm wondering whether, even though 10 milliwatts uplink is not very strong, okay, if there are lots of us, Set up in a way. No, that or Marx is no. Marx is doing well. But there are also there are there are other frequencies that we could be looking into as well. There is an uplink for telecommand up to four five zero, I think it is, or something like that, which you go up to five hundred milliwatts or up onwards. So again, because of the new ability to track the free, you know, we can because of what Mark's showing where you can correct the frequency. There is a potential that we could create an uplink system actually that will work quite well in this case. But we'll discuss that at a later thing. <coughs> I don't know what's going on there. I think they're about to get told off by the security guard. Hopefully. It's, yeah, it wasn't planned. Any ways, okay? So, um, I'm sorry, introducing you there. Um, so, Ed's going to give us a talk actually not about balloons. Because we thought this is this high altitude society. 
yeah, we do balloons all the time, but actually, it's not always balloons. Um, so we're going to talk about rockets. I named this to talk. Um, there are some seats down the front, guys. If you re I know it's in the front, and it's the worst, but at least you'd be sitting. Um, right. And has anybody not got a badge? Okay, so we're missing. Okay, fine. Grant, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do a quick talk about uh, what I've been doing in the last, well, since Christmas, really. Um, and as James says, uh, we're not just a balloon society. And in fact, I kind of think we've probably reached about as high as we can go with balloons, probably. I don't want to attempt fate, but 45 kilometres seems like quite a barrier. And certainly 50 kilometres is going to be very tricky. Um, I think the pressure at 45 kilometres is um, about 150 pascals, and it's about half that at 50 kilometres. So we're we're really running out of atmosphere pretty quickly. Um, and so if you want to get any higher, I reckon probably rockets are a good thing to look at. So, I mean, this has sort of occurred to me about this time last year. Um, one of the irritating things about the UK is that all the rocketry launch events, the ceilings are incredibly low, they're about 10,000 feet. And you can certainly build nice impressive rockets that will go to 10,000 feet, but if you want to sort of experiment with getting a bit higher, you need something more like 20 or 30 kilometer ceiling. Um, so anyway, shortly after the conference last year, in fact, it was very late last year, there was announced um, some rocketeers up in Scotland who had managed to uh, find a site whereby one could go for about 10, 12 miles in any direction and not find another human being. Um, and so that's, that site's called Ben Armine. And it's um, really up in the north of the nest, up there. Maybe a bit of a it was actually incredibly mountainous and, and difficult to, to launch rockets in, as I will get on to. Um, but regardless, at the time, we thought, oh, brilliant, because they, they were offering a 25 kilometer altitude ceiling. Um, so we decided to try and build something as CUSF that would sort of do justice to the altitude, to the, uh, altitude ceiling. So, Rockets are conventionally, or at least in the sort of amateur level, rockets are um, solid repellent. And they come in various ratings. Uh, they're ascribed a letter. So, for example, a lot of the little hobby rockets are kind of A, B, and C class motors. Um, you can go all the way up to um, O and P and things like that. But in the UK, typically M is about the largest one launches. Um, so looking at the M motors we had available, it became clear we probably weren't going to get particularly high just on a single air motor. So we decided to have a look at um, building a multi-stage rocket. So that's a rocket with various booster stages and, and a top stage. Um, so this is what we came up with. We initially wanted to really push for 25 kilometers, but in the time available, we realized we wouldn't have time to uh, design it Design it narrow enough so so basically you know the drag increases with the square of the frontal uh, with the frontal area which is the square of the diameter. So if you want to make a really really high performance rocket, you need to get the diameter right down. But that puts a lot of constraints on the design of things like the recovery system and everything else. So if you've only got three or four months in which to build the rocket, um, we've settled on something that we get to about 15 kilometers for a big a big effort saving in, and uh, a lower risk saving in terms of uh, the design. So we've got a three stage rocket. Um, it's about six meters long with all three stages. The first stage is using an N class motor, an N2500. Uh, and then the stages two and three use uh, M motors. Um, you can see the cutout here. Um, it's carbon fiber body tubes. Um, and then at the end of each tube, and at the ends of each of the tubes, there's an aluminum bulkhead. Um, and that allows the two sections to plonk it, uh, slot into each other. And then they're attached with shear pins. And then when the rockets want to separate, um, they have little uh, explosive um, pyrotechnic retractors. They're like pins that come out of a bolt with a few kilonewtons of force behind them when you, when you uh, fire a current through the plug. And um, they can break through the shear pins and separate the stages. Um, all of the stages had independent electronics and trackers. So the flight computer on any given stage <coughs> It knew what stage it was on, but it wasn't directly communicating with any of the other flight computers because previously we found that trying to talk to stages that have to disconnect with all the disconnecting electronics is quite tricky. Um, that's what we did with the European Space Agency parachute drop test thing, and it caused quite a few problems. So we thought it'd be easier for the electronics to just be aware that they're in stage two and, and figure out when to fire 
um, went to fire themselves. Um, in the nose cone, there was another tracker, and there was uh, quite an expensive GoPro camera, and um, various other bits and bobs. Um, so the footage we were hoping would be awesome uh, from it, and it was expected, yeah, expected to go to about 15 kilometres and reach about uh, max between two and three. Um, we had to fill the launch tower as well. Uh, so here is the rocket, the most rendering of the rocket on the launch tower. Um, so we did all this between January and April in, in spare time. Um, and then the launch was in May, the launch week was in the beginning of May. So we packed everything in the car, inevitably a lot of late nights and worries and panics and uh, things not being delivered. The biggest problem was that uh, the, the interfacing rings between the stages um, were being machined by a company, and then <coughs> the carbon fiber tubes we bought finished with nice machined edges. Um, except, irritatingly, um, they delivered them not with particularly square faces. Um, so we actually found that in the three-stage rocket, if we were to, without refinishing them ourselves, the, the edges, the whole rocket would not be straight. If you lined it all up, it would have a bit of a corkscrew. And uh, we basically made the call that we didn't have time to fix this, so we took the two best of the three. Uh, sets of the machine parts and switch to a two-stage rocket flying on the bottom end stage and the top, so stage one and stage three, so an end to end two-stage rocket. And this is it. Um, so this is up in the hunting lodge in Ben Armine. So, so in the middle of this, in this estate, there's a hunting lodge and then there's nothing. It's a sort of, there's a road which you drive down which seems to go nowhere for about half an hour and then that turns into a dirt track and then there's about 12 kilometers of dirt track and then there's this house um, at the end um, and then my car still hasn't recovered at all um, but yeah so here it is there's, there's a fiberglass nose pen so it's uh, radio transparent the <coughs> top stage tracker was in here and in the bottom stage the tracker was um, it was contained within the carbon fiber obviously that's basically transparent uh, opaque to radio so we had it uh, we had it on the parachute system such that when it deployed, it would be pulled out into the air and then we should be able to get a lot on it. Um, but when it was on the launch pad, the top stage radio, we could hear fine. Um, home for the week was a tent. Um, so this was out in the actual range itself, which was another few kilometers of really rough ground further on from the hunting lodge. Um, you can see we had we made, I'm not sure if you can see, but we had a little dolly to transport the rockets around. Um, and then, um, oh yes, um, yes, I wanted to point out this chap. He was one of the um, Dutch, one of the Dutch rocket team. And um, they, in the end, their motors weren't delivered because of some horrible TNT related disaster. I think a transport company would make space. Yeah. Pardon? Transport company would make space. No, it's a transport company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they could have been very annoyed, but actually in the end, they were incredibly helpful to the rest of us. And um, this was the first time we'd done anything with big motors, and their, their knowledge and expertise was very useful, especially with igniting the motors, because they make a, they take an awful lot of igniting. Um, the motors themselves are pretty big. Um, that's me with M and Ian with N. They weigh an awful lot as well. They're probably sort of, you know, 10, 15 kilos of motor. One of the annoying things about solids, uh, and the reason why I don't particularly like them, um, is because the whole thing is the combustion chamber, and therefore the whole thing has to be rated to the combustion pressure, which adds a whole load of mass that you don't really want to take if you're trying to get up to a high altitude. I think the pressures inside are, you know, many, many tens of bars, up to hundreds of bars. Um, but anyway, they, they, were, they were good for this rocket. Um, Here's the launch tower that we built. Um, so this was the launch range itself and the tent from the previous picture is just back there. Um, so the launch tower could pivot. I've got a laser pointer actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the, the launch tower can pivot um, on some hinges at the bottom. Yes, yes, so there's, there's a pivot there. So we can bring it down to horizontal and then slide the rocket on. Um, the rocket slides on with T-nuts, um, so this bar along the top is one of those um, Bosch aluminium extrusions, I'm not sure if you've seen them with the T-nut slots, 
and then we have corresponding T nuts on the side of the rocket, so we can slide it down. Um, so this is a really nice sunny day. Um, on this day, we attempted to launch. We had a we had a one hour window every day where they clear all the air traffic coming in over the poles in the North Atlantic. Um, we had a one hour window every day, so we we prepped the rocket for this day. We got it all on the pad, and we're just about ready to launch. Um, and um, and this is what the preparation looks like. Um, so this is the rocket up in Burstall. You can see there's a whole load of guidelines down to um, land anchors to keep the whole thing straight. Um, here, James is installing the bottom motor igniter, and that's ignited by us on the ground. And then the first stage flight computer detects the acceleration to detect it's launched, and that's what starts it. Um, puts it into flight mode, ready to deploy the first stage uh, uh, drogue and the primary parachutes. The second stage is ignited by its own motor and has a separate flight computer up in the bulkhead up here. I've brought along a copy of the flight computer I made, if anyone can see. It has to be very tiny to actually run out of a lot of space, but there it is. It's a, it's a three channel, um, three pyrotechnic channels, one for the motor, one for the drogue deployment explosives, mm -hmm. and one for the primary deployment explosives. Um, it's got a little Arduino Pro Mini on the back. It's quite a high speed thing. Um, but it's worth sounding a note of caution about um, things that control pyrotechnics because in order to arm this stage there was a switch underneath here and Ian here had to climb up the uh, launch tower and then turn the switch which was up here with a little screwdriver and then climb back down again. And um, it's quite a nerve-wracking thing to design the electronics for someone who has to do that because if it does go off, I mean, it really would have, these leading edges on the fins are very sharp. They're, they're aluminium frames filled with carbon fibre and they're a very sharp aluminium edge and they probably would have taken his arm off at best if the thing had launched after he'd armed it. So it's definitely worse with these things having really, really double checking your code. Um, <laughs> really <laughs> test it. <laughs> Because um, I know that sometimes, you know, with half flights, pyros and cut downs have gone off unexpectedly, you know, when people are preparing on the ground. And you really can't afford to have that kind of thing happen with these kind of motors. Um, it's also worth having, you know, <laughs> isolation and safe arm buttons really, really should be properly, completely, completely isolated on the high side. So there's no, you know, voltage down to the wiring pyro. Um, because also, bad things can happen whereby because I know a lot of a lot of pyros are sort of energized up to through the pyro loop and then back to effect, which they then turn on and, and that completes the circuits and that's how the pyro gets sent off. But that means that if for some reason the pyro wire were to get worn and there was some path back to ground in the rocket itself, which in a metal and carbon fiber rocket is quite possible, then it also would have gone off. So you really need proper complete isolation and and yeah, just test it basically. So we got ready to launch, um, and then when we uh, hit the fire button after the countdown, there was a bit of a fizzle, a bit of smoke coming out the bottom of the engine. But then nothing happened, and uh, basically, I think I, I mentioned that these motors are incredibly hard to light, and we had suffered from one of the things these Dutch rocket boys had seen before with these motors, which is that you really, really need to light them. Uh, you really got to go the extra mile to get them started. Um, and irritatingly, we'd, we thought we could run back and quickly redo the igniter, add double the igniters in, and try it. But we'd reached the end of our hour, so we had to abort for the day, which is also quite an annoying thing to, to have to disassemble a fully primed and armed rocket. Um, so we went to the next day. Um, unfortunately, the weather the next day was not glorious. It clouded over properly. Um, and this is quite irritating because the uh, trackers on here are all balloon style trackers, they're 434 megahertz. And up in Scotland, there's a lot of mountains. So you really have, it's, I mean, the, 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 the ridge next to us up this hill was sort of at 30 odd degrees to us on the ground. So you're going to lose the rocket very quickly because you're basically in a, in a little bowl. So we were really kind of counting on a visual smoke age trail just to see the direction that the other stage went. Anyway, we didn't have it. Um, so we thought, well, whatever, we'll launch it anyway. Um, 
I'm going to show you a video of the launch. I apologize, one of the guys on the team is from Donegal, and um, he's got quite excited. So, you know, cover your ears if, you're, if you don't like swear words. <laughs> Sorry about the wind noise as well. This is the How far away is that? It's 300 meters. Long, but yeah, you couldn't hear it in the wind noise, but we could hear it quite clearly on the ground. The reason there was such a long delay between the first stage firing, so so the first stage fires, the second stage should detect launch, and then and then after the second stage has detected burnout, which it looks at through uh, acceleration and pressure, um, it should wait a few seconds that we pre-calculated um, of coasting time before launching the second stage. Now after four seconds, this still hadn't come. And so, you know, I was just thinking everyone's going to kill me because it's my software and this is annoying. Um, but of course, we forgot that the rocket is already kind of, you know, four or five kilometers up by this point. So it took about 10 seconds for the sound of the second stage to come down. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so that was fine. Except that you saw I was with the Yaki there trying to track the, the second stage rocket. Basically, couldn't track a thing. The, the Doppler was such that... Um, we saw on FL Digi the traces on, on the um, the traces of, of the RTTY signal basically about 45 degrees and just launch <laughs> off the edge of the thing. Um, and um, it was spinning a bit, I think, as well. It had a frequency that the automatic gate control, however it was set up, couldn't keep up with. So we found it incredibly difficult to decode. And in fact, there was a team up on a ridge about two kilometers away who could hear the rocket clean as, you know, loud as anything when it was on the pad, who also really, really struggled to hear the, 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 um, the telemetry when it was flying, which is annoying. Um, anyway, I will show you another couple of videos of the launch. We had a camera on top of the launch tower looking down. Um, this has a nice sound. So you'll see, you'll hear a pop when the igniter first goes, but then it still takes a while for pressure to build up and for the motor to choke before it launches. Uh, And a, a high speed camera as well. And again, you'll see um, you'll see a bit of spluttering as the pressure builds up. And then it will pause just for a second, which is when the pressure's built on, enough to make the flow choke, which is where it goes supersonic right at the nozzle. And that's where you get the thrust, the thrust from. And then it's off. And then another long picture and uh, Another launch picture, you can see there's some pleasing Mac diamonds in the exhaust there. Um, and then, yeah, a chap from the press agency went up to the ridge where the tracking team was to look back down and have a look at the rocket. And that was a really nice view. But you can see, I mean, it's probably wild terrain there. And um, recovery is seriously, seriously challenging, especially with the weather, as I mentioned in a second. Um, to kind of give you an a intuition for the forces of these rocket motors, on the, um, on the launch tower, we have an exhaust deflector underneath the base of the rocket. And that's made of, I think it was four, uh, yeah, four mil thick aerospace grade aluminium, which is what we haven't had lying around, so we put it down at the bottom. And that, that was straight before, <laughs> before the rocket motor lit. I mean, yeah, it, was, it really kicked off. 
Um, so anyway, we found the first stage um, about two kilometers downrange in the grounds of the hunting lodge itself. Um, in fact, the hunting lodge's dog found it. He was really, really excited by it. And <laughs> the second stage, we could not hear a peep out of. Um, it was on 434.000 doing RTTY. I could hear a 434.000 carrier. So I thought, oh, brilliant. Well, there's, you know, there's life and there's direction finding from it. And the direction seemed to be vaguely downrange of where the wind was going. So we, we followed it for a bit. And we hopped into our, um, we had a Land Rover Defender, one of the guys James had, who, who was helping us. And um, we sort of went, um, come to downrange, stop, take a direction finding. And it seemed really on top of us. This, this signal is really quite strong. I couldn't really direction find with it. So we went another half a kilometer downrange and it was also still the same and I was getting really baffled. And then I just said, James, turn, turn the engine off for a second. And the carrier disappeared. <laughs> 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 we think it was his alternator it was generated for some problem precisely at the right, I mean, you know, five kilometers side and side, not there, but yeah. So that was upsetting. So we just couldn't find the second stage. So we went basically, sort of made a search area of this bit of Scotland where we thought it would go and spent a day or two looking. Now you can see I'm in shorts there and actually we were kind of at risk of being sunburnt on some of the days. Um, but the weather up there is so weird in addition to the terrain being difficult that within half an hour it can literally be a white out blizzard. And um, this is Ian on recovery that same day. <laughs> you know, full on horizontal snow. And, I mean, this is only after about 30 seconds, you can see it's already settling. And um, yeah, so we looked in about, I think, probably about 40 kilometers worth of walking over two days, which is difficult through that piece of bulk, trying to find a thing, but we couldn't. To be honest, the, the, the possible range of landing sites for Pibia is so enormous that, um, that we're just gonna have to hope that some of the hunters or gamekeepers come across it at some point, which should be fairly obvious. But you know, the, the, the area up there is enormous and there are lots of bridges, so it's, it's very difficult to see. And lots of little gullies, if it's not in there, you won't see it. Um, so it's, it's difficult. But anyway, we had a go. Um, but I think it's gonna be very difficult to get to you know, the sort of arbitrary barrier of greater than 50 kilometers with solid rockets. Um, as I say, the weight of the motor casing is, is a lot. Um, and the cost and faff and paperwork for big motors is also quite prohibitive in the UK, certainly. Um, so the, probably the next big thing um, will be uh, liquid wire propellant rockets. Um, so we've been having a look at that, this time not with CSF, but with, I work in a small company of three people. And uh, we have a bit of a kind of spare time project, which is to try and look at liquid propellant rockets and get them a bit, see how, just try and get uh, get to know them and get used to them and eventually look at doing something quite high, high altitude. So I'll just give you a quick overview of our uh, version one liquid propellant rocket engine that we built. It's called, uh, it's called SNARK, the engine. Um, you obviously need two fuel, well, two liquids, a fuel and an oxidizer. The fuel we picked is isopropyl alcohol. Um, that's just a nice, easy to handle liquid. It's a storable propellant. Storable meaning you can kind of keep it for arbitrary length of times, as opposed to things like cryogenic propellants, which are constantly venting off and need topping up. The oxidizer we've gone for is familiar to people in amateur rocketry. It's um, nitrous oxide. Um, that's nice because it's also cheap and storable. Um, <laughs> it's also conveniently at kind of roughly ambient English temperatures, self-pressurizing, um, you know, will generate it. It wants to be a gas, uh, even though you saw it as a liquid. So if you just open the valve, it will try and, um, it will try and shoot out. Isopropyl alcohol isn't. So you have to add uh, pressure and gas and we use nitrogen. Um, obviously, for a rocket engine, you need a combustion chamber. That's really as simple as that. It is just a chamber uh, with a throat. So you basically put an explosion in there, sort of continuous um, burning of these two fuels in the right ratio. Then you provide a little uh, geometrically, uh, or specifically shaped hole for it to come out of. And somewhere in the throat of the hole, the flow becomes supersonic, which isolates this side from any knowledge of what's happening here. This, this is a nice, all, all the losses in here are quite slow because the flame fronts aren't actually that fast. 
So that's just slow and high pressure. And then uh, you uh, make a supersonic biochoke and expand it um, to get some thrust. And to connect the two things up, we have uh, throttle valves. So um, one valve for the nitrous and one valve for the isopropyl alcohol. Um, and then, yes, you squirt in, you get fire, and then you get thrust, and we have the other end. So um, that's the sort of concept of SNARK. Um, then we had to make it. So this is the first uh, SNARK test rig. Um, you can see, um, you can see here's the chamber. It's actually quite big, but in principle, the nice thing about liquids is that the high pressure bit is contained into a very small area. It's just the chamber. And so you, um, you can store all your propellants at a lower pressure, which means you don't need all the big, heavy, heavy walls, large cylinders like you have with, um, with solid rockets. You can see you've got one servo valve here doing uh, the oxidizer, and the other one here doing the fuel. Um, and then on the back here, there is a little um, load cell. And then we've instrumented the pressures and masses of the fuel tanks. So we can measure the injector pressures, the tank pressures, everything else like that via the um, data logging equipment that we make for other things in the company anyway. Um, we rigged up a seriously gangster throttle thing here. <laughs> so Arduino to the, uh, to the servos and then a knob for n a knob for IPA and some rough uh, pulse widths in microseconds. Um, I mean, that was fun to play with, but in the end, for the actual, once we got past a certain level, we did predefined um, servo levels controlled by computer. So here is a test fire of SNARK. I should say we were quite interested in throttling because our initial concept, just to be able to hack around and, and contain it within a field, is to build a hovering rocket like they do in the States, one of those can think of much smaller and lower budget. So we want to be able to have some throttle control. So here is the first test fire. So you can see it throttling in and out. Um, now the sparkiness is because we're using uh, probably the simplest way to do uh, a, a rocket chamber, which is an ablative line on the chamber. Because there's so much heat in the chamber, it would melt everything. Often bigger rockets use, uh, use a kind of jacket of liquid, which is the fuel to uh, cool the chamber down. We just have phenolic um, as a liner, which gives us kind of 90 seconds of burn time and it's easy to replace. So that's what the sparking is. This was quite a good test. Um, we got some data from it. Um, so the important one is uh, thrust, which is this red one here. So you can see that the, the actual throttling worked. And we actually got about five to one throttling ratio, which is pretty decent. We were quite pleased with that. So that means we have had a working design. And up, up to, um, we kept it quite conservative, but this engine can run up to about 150 newtons, which is fine because our, our target um, vehicle mass is about 30 kilograms wet. Um, and then there was another teasing, teasing graph, which is this one. Um, these are the commanded survey positions versus throttle. So to me as a control engineer, that says we can do something with this. Um, it, you know, it, it basically the response is characterizable and good enough. You can see in both these graphs, um, there's basically a general downward trend on everything. That's because <laughs> the fuel tank pressures were dropping as it fired. So um, for the flying thing, we'll need some way of actually measuring these pressures so that we can compensate for them by opening up the throttle a bit more to keep, keep the thrust levels flat. So we've got, a, uh, we've got a firing engine. We now want to make something more like one of those hovering rockets. Um, so we did this in a bit of a hurry. Um, but we built, uh, this is called Gyro 5, and it's, unfortunately, none of us seem to actually have any photos of it, they just have these bad camera phone ones. But basically, <coughs> here is a fuel tank. There's a whole load of plumbing and electronics there, that's a little servo driver board. The motor is down here. This thing is just a bit of ground sports equipment, so that's the vertical test stand, basically, that we knocked up for it. And then we've got some linear actuators here and here. Um, one of the things that you need if you're making this a sort of independent vehicle, is some way of replicating all our uh, data logging equipment that we normally have on the test stand in the rocket so that the computer can use it on board. So 
built a uh, uh, little data logging unit here, which um, well, I'll probably pass it around or come and see it in the afternoon. But it's um, it's quite a nice little thing. It's got eight channels. It's designed for bridge type drivers, although we made it flexible enough to do lots of things. It does it's sixteen bit ADC and it does two hundred thousand samples per second simultaneously across all eight channels. Um, so it's a very useful thing, and that sits on board in the avionics box, which is above where the top of the photo goes off. Um, we also designed we designed the linear actuators in house. Unfortunately, they're on the rocket at the moment, so I couldn't bring them. But I've brought the linear actuator drivers, which we also made. So they're just little H bridges with feedback that can um, command the engine to vector to a specific angle. Um, I think there's another slightly more detailed, but still not very good photo at the bottom. So you can see here there's linear actuator there. It's a sort of black cylinder with silver cap uh, moving the motor in and out. And then quite recently we had the first test firing of that, which was very exciting. Um, so here it is firing. I'm doing a, just a bit of just demonstration of the veteran work. It's all very gentle. You can see the linear axis is moving there. It's a fairly violent ending. That's because um, when you command both the things to go off, there's no rate term in the control loop on the servo. So when you command both of them to go off, the fuel line shuts down much faster than the oxidizer line. So it's temporarily very oxidizer rich, which is quite bangy. So that's what that ending was. But we put a rate term in the feedback loop now. Um, because GoPros are cool, we put some GoPros much nearer this than we wanted to put the nice camera as well. So, so there's this kind of sacrificial, it, it survived, but what we thought might be a sacrificial GoPro view of the same thing. So that's, I mean, that's about as far as we've got. This specific engine is probably not going to fly because this was a very, it's quite a basic one. We use the simplest kind of injectors, which are impinging injectors, whereby you shoot two jets of oxidizer fuel into each other. Um, and they mix, but we've since built one with a pintle type injector, which is more efficient for fuel mixing. This means that you can make the whole combustion chamber shorter because if the whole point of the combustion chamber is to get everything fully combusted before it gets to the throat. Um, so if there's better mixing and better combustion, you can make the combustion chamber shorter. That means when we actually fly it, you're not moving, you're not wagging such a large hunk of metal around, which obviously parts of torque back off the rocket. Um, and uh, well, yes, that's basically as far as we've got so far. We're hoping to actually do a tethered, tethered hover for about ten seconds in the next few months. Um, and then if this works, um, I mean, we've sort of done a few quiet calculations, and we think that one can build a rocket, a liquid bi-component rocket, of about the same size as Model 1, that should, maybe a bit wider, that should get to kind of over 100 kilometers um, if you optimize, if you go for a fairly low chamber pressure and just go for a nice gentle ascent to get to about Mach 5 at 25 kilometers and then just coast all the rest of the way up. We think it's quite possible. We're working on some stuff towards that. Uh, we're building our own GPS, um, that will obviously work at the high speeds, and uh, a lot of this uh, kind of um, yeah, a lot of kind of data logger equipment, getting lots of use out of testing, and all the avionics in this has actually been performing quite well so far. We're quite pleased with it, so there's no reason it shouldn't be able to be put on a bigger thing. Um, so basically, this talk is more of an introduction, and hopefully, for the conference next year, I can come back and show you something really quite cool with any luck. But uh, anyway, that's it. Any questions? Yes. In the um, in the thrust um, graph you've got, the yeah. response seemed quite slow. It took about I don't know. It seemed like an exponential response with a time constant. I don't know. It's yes, like, it, that's just the surveys. Uh, we the valves, the first round valves, are quite sloppy because they're they're really um, frictionally ball valves. 
And the servos that drive them were old and little ones we had lying around. We switched the digital ones, it's a lot better now. This is slightly older data. Yes. Are you still thinking about launching off balloons? I know that was Not, yeah, I think basically that's a paperwork nightmare. I actually it's think it's launching from the ground is going to be easier because yeah. the cross range of balloons, if all goes wrong, is sort of 400 kilometers. Sorry, rockoons. But I think if you actually launch you know, on a known rail at a known angle, sort of vaguely out to sea, the chances of not having to go to the back end of nowhere to launch it are improved. Um, that's, something, that's something I've come to realize in the last year, really, that I actually think the ground launch to 100 kilometers is probably easier than the rocket which is not something I would have said a year ago. Yes. So, so um, when, when you're introducing the, the, the fuel mix, yeah. um, is, is it a, it's a, a, a circular aperture or something? Yes, it's two circular apertures, one for the fuel, one for the oxidizer. Well, it, it goes into the top uh, plate. Of the, the, the engine has a bulkhead with some channels in it that then goes with set a series of impinging injectors that right. just squirt jets to each other. Yeah. Tried or <coughs> I'm just wondering if you sort of experimented with different shaped apertures. And well, we're, we're doing the Pintle one now, which right. is um, the Pintle injectors are pretty good. So they sort of fire, you know, if you stick your finger over the top of the hose, you get a sort of sheet coming out sideways. So they do that with one of the fuels right. by basically firing it up in a, a, a coaxial channel with a something just in, fr in front of it that makes it all kind of sideways. And then you have another jacket around that, which fires the fuel in a cylinder coming straight out. And when the outwards one mixes with the cylinder the other, is when you get a 45 degree cone of quite well mixed fuel. Mm. And that should, yeah, that should let us reduce the combustion chamber, get a better, get a better C star, which is a, a sort of metric for performance of combustion to do with um, how much pressure you're getting out of a throat area for a given mass flow of fuel, which is a useful thing you want to maximise. Okay. Five to one ratio. Yeah. Is that the complete motor? Yeah, yeah, that was the engine. So it would lift itself quite, quite easily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so gy gyro, as I showed it, that that test ride, the last few years. Yeah, that that, that 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 will fly. Yeah, I mean, that weighed about twenty-five kilos that one, so it looks fine. We're just wanting to be sure <laughs> before we throw it, before we turn it into a fireball. We need to do a lot more work on control law and simulation and stuff. But yeah, hopefully in the next couple of months, that's the plan. Good. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ed. Right. Um, next, next talk is Habitat. Is it? Great. So last year, um, the guys came and spoke to you about Habitat, which is basically the backbone of everything we do. Um, taking over from the old system, which was a sort of badly hacked load of scripts on multiple servers. It was madness, really. But it worked a little bit. Um, and so when they were speaking to you last year, last year they were saying, this is what we're going to do, this is our plans, right? and it was a pretty substantial change. It was quite, um, it basically fitted to what, you know, a lot of the requirements we had for the system. And it's been, it's been rolled out, so this is them coming back to you to say what they found, what they've done, um, and what's going to happen in the future. What you've been using recently has been the Habitat server. Um, there's, and now it's basically another step further, which I talked to you, I suspect you're talking about, but the yeah, FSDG having Habitat on board. Yeah, so basically, and so basically it's an update plus the future. And there's some interesting ideas they've got. Yeah, These guys. we're going to be both talking about stuff that will be useful to you, like how to set up your payloads with Habitat, but we'll also tell you about stuff we've done, so it's sort of a mix. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so welcome to the Habitat Talk. It's what we're talking about. Um, first of all, there's a quick recap of what we said last year for people who weren't here or have forgotten in the kind of year in between. Then we're covering off all the things we've actually managed to change in the interim, which is a fair bit. Then there's a quick bit of talk, which is probably the most useful, which is really how you, as someone launching or tracking a balloon, should be using Habitat and how to get the most out of it. There's a section on what to do when things go wrong and helping you debug stuff and fixing things in flight and so on and so forth. Then there's three little bits of some quick apps we've put together and some details on them. 
And then at the end, just some stuff people are doing with Habitat or about it, which might be interesting. Okay, so this is sort of a general overview. Uh, it's, it's quite simplified. Essentially, when your uh, payload is received by DLF or Digi, it'll submit everything it gets uh, that starts in $2 and ends in a new line to Habitat. And Habitat at the moment is, the eventual plan is for it to be responsible for everything. Uh, that includes displaying it on the map. But at the moment, we're still using SpaceNet near DAS. So we have um, some code that submits everything Habitat passes to the map of SpaceNet. So, we, so that's had some modifications, but it hasn't been, been the full overhaul that we eventually plan for it. Uh, Habitat itself, uh, DLF or Digi is open source, but you probably don't want to look in there because it's pretty disgusting. <laughs> Habitat's nice. It's Python. We use CouchDB, which makes things uh, simpler than they would have been. Um, so this is the slightly more complicated version of that diagram. Um, feel free to ignore it if you're not particularly interested in the technical details. Basically what happens is there's DLF or Digi, which sits here, and there's either the new version which we released a couple of weeks ago and hopefully everyone is using, and in fact most people are using, which is great, or there's the old version which still works for a while. Both of those are able to talk through to this CouchDB, which is a kind of centralized database we run it's actually web accessible, which means it's database and you talk to it directly. We don't have anything sitting in front of it. But consequently, it's also responsible for its own authentication and validation and all the rest of it. And it's a really easy to use API. So if you like that kind of thing, it's open. Anyone can chat to it, get all the data out, all the data is open. Then DLF or Digi uploads its position for the little listener icons and also all of the telemetry you receive from a balloon up to the database. There's then the Habitat parser, which is really the bulk of Habitat, talks to this database and looks for new telemetry, figures out what balloon sent it, what flight it's involved with, how to decode it, what all the different things in the sentence mean. It pulls them all out, works out, turns them into a useful format, applies any fixes or filters you have associated with your payload, saves the result back into the database. Then everything else uses the database. So there's Gen Payload which is the website where you can make up your own flight document, and we'll be coming on to that in a bit. There's the calendar, which is an iCal URL. You can put it into your Google Calendar or your phone or whatever else you want to use, and it contains details of all the upcoming flights, what frequency they're on, what the payload name is, where they're launching from, etc. There's stats, which is a kind of, well, basically just some pretty graphs and what's in the database right now. We have some bigger plans for that later. Um, EPT, which is export payload telemetry and fairly self-descriptive. Anything else you can think of shoving onto it, it's open data, like I said, and there's documentation and example code and all the rest that you might need. <laughs> Plus, crucially, there's a space notes tracker, which is the website you're used to using. For well, the basic data. features some pretty graphs and what's in the database right now. So, recently we data. released a new DLF um, which is export payload to them. Um, essentially, uh, so as you saw, the two the new one and the old one. This one now talks to the open data, like I said. Own three different servers um, uh, with old scripts. It doesn't, it doesn't fully accommodate some new features that we've added to have to have like and 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 like and 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 CouchDB is a database, uh, well, it's a document it's database, no uh, SQL, and it's um, very fancy, Web 2.0. And um, crucially, a document is just a big block of JSON, which means it's free form data. And to have some control over that, we have these validation types of documents, which all have to meet certain standards. 
early. Um, what the law in London needs to care about too much are things like less information, <laughs> distance of entry, <laughs> behaviour to that entry, which are mostly what they sound like, and you generally have that kind of thing taken care of for you. And crucially, has payload configuration, which describes how particular payload transmits data, and that means things like and for flight documents, which just describe a flight, so saying, hey, we're going to launch from here at this time, and it's going to have this big piece of paper. Those would be two documents you can make up yourself, and it's not very easy to make them up yourself. And uh, we'll come on to how you do that. So, one of the problems we had with Habitat until our recent update is you had to keep on maintaining and activating the payload. So, you tried it, it is a two payload playlight. And hopefully, if you don't modify the circuit, if you don't modify the circuit, they're always active, so you don't have to come on to the ISC and ask us to do the payload. Um, we, we intend to have a testing section of tracker, so anything that doesn't belong to an active file, I'm going to have a testing section, which means you can test whenever you want that. Don't worry about something. Um, I would encourage you, they, they have names and descriptions, I would encourage you to give them their descriptions. Anyways, they can't be modified, they can't be modified, they can't be modified. Uh, which is a consequence of this. You have to add an account to the password and you can add an account to the password. So instead, you can simply add an account to the password and create new ones and replace the old ones. And then we have some stuff to make sure that someone doesn't really have to do that. It's a payload configuration document. There's transmission and sentences. And the sentences, the past things, are going to send out too much. You can see the annual and the transmission of the payload. Essentially, that, is, that, that bit doesn't matter. If that breaks, do you allow the configuration, which describes how particular payloads are transmission, essentially, they describe what the flight document, which just describes the frequency, saying, hey, we're going to launch from there, and it's going to have this price. Those are the two documents. mostly just to show people what it looks like. There's a link to it. It's got lots of help as you use it that tells you how to go through. It validates everything you put in so you can check you're doing it right. Um, it should be really easy to use. Adam, if we still like doing like uh, a game where we make a generator, is there still the generator? <laughs> your... Yes, yeah, somewhere. <laughs> it, that was the entertaining old version <laughs> which we had by the last conference. Um, you might have the, the formats that generate slightly different. Okay. So, yeah, basically, this is at habitat.habhub.org slash gem payload, or if you just go to habitat.habhub.org, there's a link to it. Um, then we need to talk about this more. What, what, happens, what happens to the existing payloads that are, that are on there? Uh, so, everything that was on the old system has been migrated across with a description that says this was migrated automatically. You might want to check it. It should just work fine for all the old payloads, so you don't need to make a new document yourself now. But as things change in the future, you need to. One thing you might want to look out for is that the old system was much more relaxed about how many fields it received. If it got too many or too less, it would just stick them somewhere or ignore them. And the new habitat will, will refuse to pass it if it doesn't have the correct fields. Yeah. I mean, I noticed that the, the naming, when I looked earlier, was different. Like, because we were HAM1, I noticed that the name you've got is HAM, mm -hmm. but then it shows it up as HAM1 on the, on the next yeah, plot. So because you can have multiple sentences with different uh, different call signs, if for whatever reason you have suppose two transmitters in one payload, um, the name doesn't necessarily have to be the call sign. Oh right, okay. So presumably the way it happened was just when it was actually moved across. It yeah. Was just the way so they're moving across was an automated script, but just did its best. I think. Yeah. So if you have multiple transmissions in your document, then there's a grayed out automatic switch mode in the new DLF or Digi which will activate and if you click that it 
literally in instantly switches between Roti and Domino X with the correct settings. Uh, you can also do multiple board rates, Roti, that's pretty useful. Um, at the moment, you can automatically configure with DLF or Digi, Roti, Domino X, and House Driver, um, those two modes. Uh, we can we can add auto configuration for pretty much anything that DLF or Digi can currently decode, but we haven't done it yet because nobody uses anything but those three, really. Okay, uh, sentences. There's a couple of different formats you can have on your payload. For instance, maybe you transmit a long field with lots of sensor data and then transmit a few shorter ones with just position. So it will support things like that. There's support in particular for having fields where you don't have GPS lock but you still have sensor data. To let Habitat know we don't know where the position is, so don't maybe plot it on the map or plot it at the old point, but here's some valid sensor data which you still want to record. <coughs> so there's a way of doing that which is fairly straightforward. Um, naming fields, one thing we found a lot with the old generator was that it gave you no help at all in this matter and people came up with lots of wonderful names which didn't really stick together very well. What we decided on is basically people naming fields like this would be lovely and the new generator automatically suggests field names for you and if you start typing it has a drop down and it all looks quite nice. Um, the advantage of having standardised names is that later statistics look a lot better. We can say, hey, of all of these flights, here's lots of temperatures, here's how many satellites have you in different places, whatever. Um, it just helps to keep things consistent. You don't have to, if you really want, you could use other names. Um, yeah, fields can be time, coordinates, string, integers, floats, which pretty much covers all races. Um, so you can, in the, uh, you can now automatically, with this pretty box you see on the right, this is a screenshot from the wizard where you've pasted an example sentence. You can tell it that you want to divide a number by 10, suppose you're transmitting millibars. Or if you're doing something crazy, you're transmitting a raw sensor value, then uh, as long as it's linear, Habitat can deal with that for you. Uh, we can do d division, multiplication, and addition, and then round it to a nice value. So uh, w what we'd really like is if everyone could turn their data into the SI base or derived unit. Uh, that way, suppose you have some temperature data on two payloads, and one of them was uh, temperature's a bad example, suppose battery, and one of them's in millivolts, one of them's in volts, it's going to look a bit similar on the graph. So it'd be great if everyone could turn it into um, the SO based units, which you can find on Wikipedia if you're not familiar with them. But literally, that just means yeah. volts instead of millivolts and degrees Celsius instead of Fahrenheit or something along those lines. Kilograms, because mass is hilarious. Yes. Um, if you, if Gem Halo detects that it's a number, then it will give you the scale response. So. Um, are you asking to, uh, for us to just use this to convert it to SI or to actually uh, transmit the value? No, transmit whatever is easiest for you and then Habitat can deal with it. You just tick the scale list box. Um, so in this example, I it said it's a temperature. I transmitted 10 times the value because I didn't fancy dealing with floating point on the microcontroller and then just asked Habitat to divide it by 10. Okay. So you're just putting the conversion to SI here. I've noticed a lot of people like transmitting hex, so if there's any chance of hex to deck conversion in the box, that could be useful. Yeah, we can add that to just drop the function in the box. Um, yeah, so this is the whole passing without a lock. Basically, there are a lot of ways of doing it based on however you think it's easiest for payload. You can have a field which says whether you've got GPS lock or not, and that can have whatever you want in to say it's locked or not locked. Or you can just transmit zeros for latitude and longitude. Or you can do something crazy and tell Habitat how to deal with it. And there are some pretty options, like it transmits a particular sentence format, or it transmits a certain value in a field, or whatever else. Um, this is all kind of stuff you can definitely do and would encourage people to do if they can, but it's not crucial for correct passing of the payload, basically. Um, question. Um, right, so. Whenever you modify the payload, you need to change the payload configuration document or it won't pass it along. Um, that's, that's like if it's broken, then that's the first thing you should check. As soon as you press save and then payload, it will start working. It always uses the latest document, it checks every time it uh, receives a new string if there's anything new. Um, and as soon as you press save, if you press refresh and DLF or digital, it'll pop up. There's no waiting, you don't have to come on to IRC and ask us about these documents. Um, we, I think. Yeah. So this is DLF or Digi, DL prime, configure, 
MDL clients have is an all payloads list which shows every single payload it knows about. You can type the payload name in here and it will automatically filter the list which makes it a bit easier to find things. Oh, it's also worth noting that all of your, because I said they can't be mod modified or deleted, all of the old versions will appear in the list as well. So um, the newest one will be at the bottom, just click it. And the descriptions are shown so you can work out what's what. Okay, uh, flight documents describe flight, make one when you know you're going to launch. It doesn't matter if you don't launch particularly, but you don't need to make one just to test, only when you know you're actually launching. Ideally, they say where you're launching from, when you plan to launch, uh, you can give the launch a name, you can include a project name, any other metadata you want. Uh, you tell it what payloads are going to be on the launch, and the idea generally is one launch document per balloon. So if you've got two or three payloads, you can stick them all on there, it will know about it, that's all great. Um, the key thing in launch documents really is their launch window, which is the date range between which the telemetry coming in is counted as associated with that launch. By default, the gem payload thing selects the day of the launch, so anything from midnight to midnight is included. If you're doing something special, or you think you might be launching over a weekend or something, you can set that range to three days or a week or longer if you want. And then launch documents do act, or flight documents, sorry, do actually get approved. Basically, because they're what controls what will show up by default, what shows up in the quick drop down list in DLF or Digi, what shows on the map, etc. Uh, we have a really quick approval process just to make sure no one spams this or anything. All you have to do is ask someone, there's some details later about how you do that. We click a button, it's approved, it will go live straight away. So there's not much waiting, but there's a little bit more. However, because you can test without approval, that shouldn't really be an issue. As long as you ask someone within you know, a few hours of the launch, it'll probably be okay. Once you've approved the flight, if you need to change something, you'll have to come and ask us though, otherwise it will defeat the flight. Mm -hmm. So uh, you might have encountered this already, um, like if something's going wrong, this displays the full output from the puzzle, which is quite verbose. It'll tell you exactly what it's done, what went wrong, and we, we've got some example outputs in a second. Essentially, um, you can open the URL in the browser, which is linked from habitat.hadlock.org, and if your payload isn't showing up on the map, that should be the first place you go, because um, that will tell you whether Habitat's getting the uh, strings from DLF or Digi, and then what it does or doesn't do with them. So there are some examples like invalid checksum, or string contains characters that are not principal ASCII, or here it tries to pass some string and then says incorrect number of fields. The idea of all of these is they're relatively self-explanatory messages and hopefully let you know what's going on. Um, some are coming straight out of Python, so like invalid literal float, there's some letters in here, you can't turn letters into a floating point number, it gets upset. So those are the kind of very messages you'd expect to see. And it will have your payload name and the sentence it tried to pass and which call sign uploaded the message and all the rest of it there as well. So hopefully that's enough for you to figure out what's going wrong and look into fixing it. Uh, this example is if you had two sentences on one payload. This is um, an American payload. They had a short format and a long format. So they added two sentences to their payload configuration document and only the one with the correct number of fields will match. But in the log it will tell you what happened to the one that failed and then the one that succeeded. Um, right, hot fixes. So, yeah, this is for things that go wrong and you realise too late to change. Basically, Habitat supports running any code you want on any of the telemetry coming in to change it dynamically, either before it's passed, by actually changing the sentence string, or after it's passed, like scaling some data or fixing some bugs. Um, this is most famously used for zero padding, which, in case you haven't come across it, is where people construct a floating point number from two integers. And if your latitude was, say, 51.005, and you have two integers, and you stick them together with a dot in the middle, you get 51.5, which is half a degree wrong and a big issue. We have a common hotfix for this. If someone comes up with that issue, just go, yeah, and click the button, and it'll fix it. But um, anything along those lines we can fix pretty easily. The main thing is that right now, only us two can write the code because it's signed, and then the database checks for signature against our certificates and so forth. Um, hopefully a few more people will be able to eventually, but you need to get one of our attentions, which means you probably want a small amount of notice if it's happening while the flight's going. Hopefully one of us will be around, usually we are. Yeah, if we have um, spare time, we'll probably just write it for you and then add yeah, it. Yeah, it, it tends to work out quite well. This is an example where there wasn't actually a bug, but it was the best picture we could find of someone just letting go of the payload. Um, that one worked fine. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so the calendar's pretty cool. It just 
it literally is surprisingly simple for what it uh, achieves. It just exports iCal from the database. Um, and then as, so as soon as you've done that, as soon as the flight gets approved, it'll show up, like, here's a screenshot from this tablet. It showed, I've added the iCal feed to my Google Calendar. It just gets synced, and now I have flights in my calendar. It's pretty cool, really. To give people an idea, this was someone in our team was like, oh, we should have a calendar. And then it was like, okay. And then 20 minutes later, we had a calendar. The database is just that easy to use. The data is all there in the right format. All this is like, I don't know, 20 lines of Python that connects to the database, says, give me the list of flights, and then outputs them as an iCal feed. And there's a Python library for both halves of that, so it's just gluing it together. Um, if anyone else has ideas along that kind of line, they're very easy for people to do or to suggest or something like that. So, yeah, export payload telemetry is coming soon, officially. Here's a screenshot of the user interface, which is nearly done. Uh, there was an old version of this where you typed in a call sign and it gave all the sentences. The new version is slightly fancier in that you select the payload and you can select a flight alternatively. And then you can pick what fields you want. So you can get the raw data out or you can get the past data out and you can get it out in CSV or JSON. And it's all very nice. Um, it will be done soon. In addition to this nice uh, interface, there will also be a sort of machine-friendly version if you want to have a script, uh, contact the database and get some CSV if you don't fancy talking in JSON. Yeah, so I, right now some people are trying to get telemetry out in all sorts of exciting creative ways, like passing the debug log. And um, what would be nice is if they just talk to the database and we're making that as easy as possible, essentially. Is, is that um, archived then? So can you go back historically? Yes and no. Um, right now this only has the current data. We haven't exported all of the old telemetry, though we've still stored it, so we can get at it if someone asks, and it's uh, fairly easy to. Yeah, I'd probably get mine. So yeah, the sure. plan is to fairly soon add a more sophisticated archive system, so that once flights have happened or in a couple of months behind, we can bundle up all the telemetry data, and you can just download an archive for each flight and do whatever you want with it. We, because we upgraded the database, we changed all the formats, so we couldn't keep the data. But we have a backup of both that and the original system completely before it a complete database backup which will eventually yeah. plan to be restored. So pretty much if you ever upload a telemetry to any of the distributed systems ever, you've got it somewhere. So this is the uh, statistics. It's, it only, now in the new system, it only counts actual flights. So that's why you should say in launch windows correctly or you'll be cheating on the uh, stats game. Essentially, you can look at pie charts for the receivers who picked up a particular payload or the, the overall receiver score and so on. It's just a bit of fun, really. Again, this, this is another benefit of using CouchDB. There's no server-side. We don't have to run um, like a, a Python server to do this. It's just some JavaScript glue and a nice graphing library and job done. Uh, this section was originally called AKA How to Beat M0 UPU, who previously <laughs> dominated the statistics since we swapped the new database. So hasn't yet regained its top place, but no doubt will soon. Um, and the only thing we could find on that is this 32 RPG <laughs> stack of a huge, huge system. Um, this is actually designed for Earth, Moon, Earth communication, but would probably track a hand fight quite successfully. <laughs> um, yeah, so the API is how you talk to the database. It is all really documented. There's example Python code and JavaScript code, and there's loads of couch libraries for every language. And the format of all the documents is really nicely documented. If you're at all interested in writing code, it should be really easy. If you have any problems, you can talk to us and we can help you. And uh, there's and sky's the limit, as it were. There are fairly good CouchDB libraries for most languages. Um, C is a bit, bit odd, but you know, the rest is fine. You can you, that takes away most of the hard work doing the HTTP. You just you just ask for a document ID and it gives it to you. Um, oh, here's the example code. In fact, this is straight from the documentation. It's actually a screenshot of the happily formatted documentation. Here's all the Python code you need to print all the upcoming flights. You grab the library, connect to the server, say I want all the payloads, not the flights. Say I want all the payload configurations, and then for each one you print that. And that that's it. I mean, it's like that's what's that five lines of code. Um, JavaScript is much the same. There's more examples and documentation. So if you need help or want to ask a question about Habitat, the easiest thing is to come onto IRC. Um, like if you highlight our names, if you say our names, then like my phone vibrates, that kind of thing, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll notice. And uh, if you go to 
hash high altitude if you prefer. Um, if you're going to ask a really long -winded question and then there's going to be a lot of discussion about it, then you can go into hash hat hub, which is we're in there as well. And it just keeps everything to the side. Similar story for the um, this separate mailing list. We don't want to fill the main cast mailing list with uh, embarrassing information about our bugs. So if you join that an email, similar thing. If you'd love, if you prefer GitHub, then everything's on GitHub. It's all open source, and you can add issues. Um, right. So coming to the end, there's just some shout outs. The new Habitat theme, which is this presentation and all the new tools and everything else, is Daniel Sewell, who's over there, has spent lots of time making it look pretty, and also really easy to write apps in. It's a nice CSS framework and stuff. Um, Anthony gave us the servers and a new server soon and other exciting things and that runs all of the Habitat stuff really. And the predictor. And the predictor and the wiki and everything else you'd likely use except space to us at the moment. Yes. Uh, there's an Android Chase Car app which some people have played with. It's a really simple app. It talks to the database. I don't think it was very hard to write. No, it was not over here. That was pretty easy to write, hopefully. Um, so that's cool. There's DLFL Digi and Hapound which is FS Phil or Philip, who's at the back there. Um, Habhound's a kind of quick app you write to talk to the database and show some balloons and stuff. He's also put a lot of code into DLF or Digi, and also James Coxon, who really made DLF or Digi. I broke it, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, which is kind of a key tool to all of us. And yeah. yeah, the final slide is a picture of what Gempedos looked like before the new theme. Oh yeah, here we go. So th this is tree theme. This is my attempt at CSS. And then, and then this is post theme. Um, I won't embarrass myself by showing you what gem payload used to look like before this one. Oh goodness. Um, you might remember it. I like greys because I can't pick colours. <laughs> Great. That's it. <laughs> so yeah, questions. Yes. GPS data format. Decimal. It doesn't. It can be decimal, decimal, dot, decimal, 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 or you can do ddnm dot sssss, or you. and then they could get past them exactly the same way. So we don't have any concrete plans to do that. We probably could if someone had a definite use case right away. <coughs> if someone wanted to write the code, that would be great too. It wouldn't take very much. Something to receive emails and then poke them into a database. And it would be pretty straightforward to do. So that would be fine. Yeah, that you can use code, that would be APRS. Yeah. yeah, so APRS, I think there's already some code somewhere that does I actually go straight into the space yeah. Yeah. So okay. yeah, so APRS is not a thing we could quite readily support. Yeah, it's already written on the And then that could just go straight into the internet and go to GP to sort of. Not really a question, but just a thank you again for all the really hard work in the last year. Very good. <laughs> Yes. Um, if you guys uh, look at doing uh, 
when you're doing your statistics, uh, analyzing any of the, uh, like the, the DOP values, if anybody reports those, um, because that, that should uh, affect how accurate the position and altitude reported are. So most people don't. A lot of people report number of satellites in view, but not enough data to calculate a DOP, and I don't think very many people report a DOP directly. And um, that's dilution of position, in case people are not familiar with the acronyms, which is basically to do with the geometry of satellites in view, how good a lot of people get. Can you work it out from the position and time using the, the satellite? Only view satellite which satellites data. they had in view, which you don't. You know the number of satellites, but, but not the yeah. Let's give it. Um, it's yeah, it's just the most paid data. data. Yeah. So, so for example, Steve, uh, his pay is now all have it because he sure. used it as a sort of test with the latest and trust the latest. If you, if you transmit it and tell Habitat what it is, then it will show up as a field of map, even though you don't like, draw a circle or anything. Great. Oh. Um, are you, have you thought of, about security or authentication or anything like that? Yes, extensively. It's a really boring problem to try and solve in this context, <laughs> basically. Do you mean... I mean, say... Somebody has a grudge against somebody else and they try to wreck their flight by uploading bonus data yeah. or whatever. Yeah, so the idea is basically flight documents take priority over testing documents, and testing documents are shown elsewhere anyway. Flight documents will get approved against well, a specific payload. What about telemetry? The main problem is people yeah. uploading fake telemetry. Essentially, there's nothing we can do about that at the moment. to start signing everything your payload sends, but that's... Yeah, either... It's even like a reputation system or something like that. You could try having a reputation system, but then you need authentication. Um, that means everyone using Dell or Digi has to log in. We could make an optional login system, but then have exactly the same problem. I think the other problem is that you know we slightly rely on people to spare at the moment helping out. You know we've yeah. had flights where suddenly we're like we're recruiting in from some other country, and we can't be like, oh yeah, fill in this book form. It needs to have that sort of anonymous yeah. flexibility. Basically, it hasn't been a problem yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, if someone starts doing it, it'll be fairly yeah. obvious. It's yeah. like there's a flight going and sort of the wheels yeah. start splitting in two directions and the trace zigzags between the shots sure. happening. We could have like a majority. You could actually sign the script and you can sign in like RSA or something. But you could have a secret parameter in the payload definition which only you have the passenger without it and the person doing the flight. You could check some of the names to keep that. If that was 16 bits, I think that would be quite a lot to obfuscate. You could. Uh, you need a slightly flight time issues. Yeah, you could, you could replay it. Yeah, could. So, yeah, it wouldn't solve all the problems. Yeah. But also, crucially, there's no way of having a bit of data that only Habitat knows about at the moment, really. It would be really tricky. And also, probably no one would use it. So <laughs> You could have a standard bit of code that ran on the on board the yeah, actual except payload. Yeah, people use different computers and payloads and write their own code and yeah. Yeah. have yeah. enough problems. It took about two years to get people to use checksums. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Natural error was asked. Quick shout out, please don't use Excel checksums anymore. Like, mm -hmm. the, you will get packets that pass the checksum and aren't correct. Mm -hmm. It'll make everyone sad. Use CLC 16. There's so much example code for it. It's just better. Thanks, guys. Oh, did you? Um, yeah, I need to actually look at the next thing I need. John, are you going to talk next? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Right, so I'll just come Where is my presentation? I don't know. Where will we find it? I think that's the interesting to do. Yeah, I think it's on our desktop. Oh, I don't know. Let's have a look. I think that's right. I downloaded a couple of those. Yeah, that's right. So, I've managed to do it, I think. Yeah. 
Right, so we're nearly there. Um, we've got John going to talk next, and then we're going to do Phil and Dave are going to talk as well after that, and then there should be lunch. I'll go and check that there is lunch. Um, and then I've been for a bit for a while. So John's going to speak today about, about really, the, so we've actually had a lot of talks on hardware, payloads, we've had a talk about the server side of stuff. This is about software and some just really advice, I think, is the best thing, really, is it? Yes, yeah, so it, it's really to depress you. So <laughs> after all those enjoyable talks, and I want to tell you about all the things that can go wrong, and particularly about software. And the goal of this talk is really to make you think about the software that's in any of these flights, um, because, you know, you, you know, you're capsule. People worry about, you know, where's it going to land, and will the knots come undone, and sometimes I look what happens in software. Um, I have lots of experience programming in one flight, so I'm not going to claim to know a lot about power to tube balloons. Uh, that's my little thing there, and you can see it at the back if you care about it. Uh, but I know lots about software, and this is what this talk is about. So don't ask me about balloons. Um, one of the things that, that is bad about software is that, um, in fact, Richard Feynman said this, that it's incredibly seductive. Right? You sort of start writing code, and it's interesting, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and suddenly you've got this complexity which you didn't imagine. And in fact, if you look at it, um, for example, in my flight, you, know, you had a parachute, pulse iron box, some Arduino type thing, and almost 3,000 lines of code. Right? It's, and if you uh, are in the industry, there's typically something like two to four defects per 1,000 lines of code. So my code probably has five to 10 errors in it. And no matter what you've written, no matter how good a software engineer you are, you'll be somewhere on this, this defect rate. Now, uh, the problem with these defects is some of them will be completely you know, innocuous, and some of them will cause your balloon to be lost forever. Um, so it's easy to concentrate on all the hardware and all this kind of stuff, and where am I going to get helium from, and then write a load of code and discover that something terrible goes, goes wrong. Um, so I made a list, I asked people in the in IRC um, for things that go on. And also, I'd, I've been sort of collecting these things. These are all real things that we've seen. Um, we've, we've seen a few times, you know, the computer just crashed before you. Uh, just lock up. Um, the altitude go negative uh, at some point. Uh, the latitude and longitude, and that happens all the time. There's, even, there's a whole page on latitude and longitude going wrong, uh, where you suddenly, particularly if you cross the meridian, um, and I'm sure the same thing would happen if you cross the equator. Uh, cut down trees in the back of the car. Um, that was day, I think. Uh, long periods of no transmission. That's, that actually happens. In, I've seen a couple of times where it suddenly just dies and then it reappears at some other point, you know, it comes back. Um, forgetting to set up the GPS before you launch, and then suddenly, ah, oh, you know, that's actually happened a few times. Uh, not turning the camera on, that's a classic one. Um, running out of space, and the altitude jumping around rhythmically, and that's an interesting one that happened fairly recently. Um, so, uh, the thing about computers, and it bears saying it over again, is that computers do exactly what you tell them to do. And that's the sort of the curse and the joy of computers, which they do exactly what you tell them to do, uh, which means you can predict what they're going to do. And that means you can actually test what they're going to do. Um, on the other hand, they will do exactly what they're going to do. So if you can tell them to do something bogus, they will happily do it. And they'll do it at 20,000 meters. And you won't have any chance of going and plugging a USB cable and fixing it. The good thing is you can test. So this talk is really about trying to make you test stuff. Um, your code is on its own out there. If there's something wrong with it, and it goes wrong, you can't fix it. And also, uh, these blue flights are quite harsh environments. You know, it's not, you know, people say, well, why don't you just use your cell phone or something? And it's like, well, there's lots of things that can go wrong, right? And so there's lots of complexity. It's cold, there's vibration. I mean, in my flight, you can actually see how much rotation there was causing torsion on things inside. Uh, stuff breaks, you know? Temperature sensor just stops. GPS decides it doesn't really work. This altitude or does something funny. Um, uh, you know, some GSM thing you're using causes a problem. You have to really think about failure mode. It's very tempting to sort of get it working, go, well, it works, and you've forgotten about how it's going to go horribly wrong. So I'm going to talk about some deadly sins of software, which apply um, to uh, 
the loons is everywhere else. Um, if you're an experienced programmer, and sometimes when you're an experienced programmer, um, and I did this, and I'm a very experienced programmer, you get it working, and you go, it works. And you satisfy yourself with it works. You do it once, and I did this, uh, putting uh, my balloon, first of all, got a GPS lock, I put it in my back garden, got a GPS lock, saw it come out, and never, you know, in the uh, you know, I thought, wow, you know, it works. I then realized that the GPS was off by about a quarter of a degree. Um, luckily, I caught it, but it's very tempting to, you know, to think it's going to work. And the only solution to this is testing and absolute paranoia about what could go wrong in your code. Um, last minute changes. Never, ever, ever change anything last minute. And what I mean by last minute is after you've done tests. And this was a, this was a classic one, uh, eight one, the camera completely failed. Um, you can change a value from 600,000 to 1 million, and the camera crashed. And I tested it. I had tested it with this value. It turned out a new basic, there's an integer limit, and I'm just stupidly, there's this limit. But it's easy to look at that and say, well, that's stupid, that would never happen. But the thing is, it doesn't matter what you're using, whether it's UBasic or C or anything, there are always things that you can screw up completely, and they, and they will always happen when you change it just before you fly. You just don't do this. Be paranoid about, I change something, I'm going to test that piece of code again, I'm going to do some simulation, whatever you need to do. Uh, being far too clever, this is what I did. Uh, I'm going to admit lots of mistakes that I made here. Um, I <coughs> invented the value of 2 pi. Um, I needed to convert uh, between radians and degrees, and I just typed in the value of 2 pi. I, when I was at school, I learned pi to 100 decimal places, um, and so I thought, well, I don't need to use pi, I can just type it in, and I need 2 pi here. So, and I actually, this is actually a combination of um, e and 2 pi that I somehow <laughs> <laughs> So, what happened was, I then put the flight in my back garden, got this clever tree that came out, I thought, fantastic, I've got a lock, everything's going to be brilliant. And I took the valley and I put it into Google Maps, and it was in the middle of a park, which is about half a degree away from me, uh, because of this. Don't be too clever. Always try and do things in a simple fashion. Um, being clever, no matter how good you are, is good you are. Um, overlooking odd behavior. It's very easy when you've got something working to sort of go, well, that'll never happen again, or that was a glitch. Or something like that. I had this. Uh, I was testing the Ritty output in my kitchen, and every now and then the Ritty was garbled. Because oh, uh, sort of overlooked and gone. Be all right in the day. Turned out what was happening was interrupts from the GPS were happening during the Ritty transmission, and then stretching out the signal. And so you have to be really honest with yourself with code. It's, it's, I, I actually think being a programmer is a very hard psychological thing. You have to be extremely honest with yourself. Uh, you have to look at it and go, there's something going wrong. And as I say, expect the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, something's going to go wrong. There's some horrible thing like this. So when you see an odd thing, get to the bottom of it. Uh, because it could happen in flight. And you know, this would have been a real pain in flight. Because actually, it would have happened a lot in flight. Because, we had, because the GPS would have been moving. There were all sorts of interrupts happening. And we could have had a complete disaster. I could have had a complete disaster. Uh, copying other people's code. I personally think this is a bad idea. And if you do, you damn well read that code to make sure you understand what it does. It is very easy to copy this code. We had this example I'm going to show you um, later on where this was a or semi disaster. Uh, but I think the best practice is get some of this code if you want to, read it, understand it, and do your own version to make sure you understand what's going on. Unless it's one that you can absolutely say has flown on a thousand flights and is accurate. And even in the case I'm going to show you, uh, that was the case, and in fact, it was there was some rubbish in. So be very careful about just taking other people's code that you don't understand. I realize it's easy for me to say because I've been programming for years, uh, but it is very important. There's a lot of complexity, and you will be very disappointed if it goes up and suddenly you say, whoops, uh, it doesn't work, or I mean, it's not my difference. <coughs> um, this was this is an example of um, AP, APRS tracker that's been around for a long time. Um, used on a balloon flight, this was in Slovakia, I think. This is the actual altitude track that was transmitted, and it looks a little odd. Where's that laser pointer? So, this is what it actually did, and then it sort of came down like this. But this is the reported altitude. You can see it's doing this, and then this, and then this sort of stuff. So, it turned out that because it's APRS, it's in feet. So they had to do meters to feet conversion, and if there was an eight or a nine, 
in the altitude as reported in decimal in meters, so imagine the actual thing, but then the feet conversion wouldn't work. Um, and this has been around, this is a piece of code that you know, lots of people have used, and what you don't know on this flight is actually what the max altitude was, because it's probably this, but you know, there's all sorts of nonsense going on where it's recently increased. And the reason it does this, that's where the eight or nine is the most significant figure, right? So the, the, the further to the left is the worst the error. So you can see this is down the bottom, and then oh, you know, so and then and so on like that. Uh, and, and had it gone much higher, we'd be in a complete disaster. Actually. So be very careful of copying other people's code. Um, this is another classic one. <laughs> assuming, <laughs> assuming that finding a bug solves a problem, and there's lots of research in computer science that bugs tend to cluster. So you remember I said about there's so many bugs per thousand lines of code. Um, everybody has got some bit of code they don't understand well, or they didn't understand the problem they were trying to solve. Uh, bugs tend to cluster. So what happens is you'll, you'll often fix a bug and not realize there are other ones in that area. So it's very much worthwhile when you do fix something, having a look at the lines of code around there and making sure that you understand what's going on. Because this happens over and again in software development. That And it did happen with Cloud 1 and Cloud 2. They were sort of more than one bug that had to be fixed. It took a few flights to have like, maybe two or three to get it all. And this is just, this is not specific to inexperienced or experienced programmers, or ballooning or anything else. This is just stuff that happens with software. They tend to cluster together. So bear that in mind. Um, yeah, so this is what happens when we do that. So um, yeah, this is a, this this stuff is so common. Go to the wiki and read the page about latitude and longitude conversion. I'm not even going to talk about it. Um, you know, where, where was this balloon? You know, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting to, to try and figure out, you know, it's probably here somewhere, right? So, and that bloody meridian getting in the way. Uh, this other common thing to bike control is lack of floating point support. Be very careful with anything you do with floating point, you know, where you're doing any sort of conversion things because you haven't got a floating point on your controller. And also small integers, things that are ints, they can overflow very quickly. That APRS bug was because guy was using um, a char, which can go up to 255, and it was just overflowing. Somebody was doing 8 times 33, and overflows and wrap around again. So you have to be very careful about looking at numbers and thinking that number might actually get bigger than the space I'm going to store it in. Uh, you might never be a great programmer, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be, but you can be a paranoid tester. Uh, that, that's really my message, and you can go and test in a paranoid fashion. And I'm going to talk about some good things you can do. Um, don't have any infinite loops in your code. You know, here's some, oh, sorry. Here's some, here's some, <laughs> it's some, like so. No, this is not name and shame. This is actually this is actually a good thing. So this is about the, the Atlas 3 code. What this is doing is reading from the GPS. And it's looping around here. See this infinite loop here? Down here there's a timeout. If it hasn't got what it's looking for in three seconds, it's just going to give up. Uh, you never, ever want an infinite loop in your balloon. Never ever assume that something's going to come back, especially if you're reading something external, right? You're reading the GPS. That GPS might have been hit by a bird and fallen off, and it's never going to come back and give you that result. And you're now sitting there, and you're never going to always have something like this, a timeout or some way of getting out of that loop, because otherwise you could be stuck up there and it's not coming back. Um, this, was, this was something I did with the camera. I was terrified that I was going to you know, mess up the settings on the camera, so I wrote this uh, code that tested every single setting to make and so it wouldn't let me run the camera. And actually, the day we did it, Ed was there. Uh, the batteries, uh, the voltage on the batteries was too low that I had. We swapped out the batteries. It wouldn't let me run the camera. Uh, this is very easy to do. I just wrote a little function that just checks these different values. This is uh, CHDK uh, written in Lua, just to make sure I hadn't got the flash on or something that was going to kill the battery. You know, by the time I got it, um, it's a good idea to do this sort of stuff. You, you know, especially you know, on that day when you're trying to put the thing together, there's so many things you can forget about. Yes. Excuse me for me. A good practice also to have a checklist of some sort. Uh, it is. You know, I I have a checklist, kind of and I did look at it a couple of times. But I was this was this was even stronger because it did it for me. And then the camera, I switched it on. I said, "Yeah, there's something on my battery. I can't even get back." So, luckily, my experience with the checklist, I always make one. Never, never, never check. Well, there's uh, <laughs> it's just so much. There's so much going on. Yes, although there's a famous quote, I, I can't remember, well, I think it's Eisenhower who said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. And I think that's making the checklist makes a difference, because as you make it, you think about all the things that you have to do. One other with uh, cameras is uh, certainly more manageable. 
Is what, sorry? If, if you're saving more money, what you're saying? Yes, I think I had that as a test. Was that there? I, well, I think I did. I think I had it. Um, maybe I didn't on there. Alright, but I had that in your seat, so I'll never need to do it for you. Um, I, know that, I know that this thing calculated the available disk space by working out the average size of a JPEG and then calculating yeah. that. Could I get enough photos in? Um, another one, self, more self checking. This is this is again out of three checking that GPS is actually going to work at altitude, so it's actually going through and checking that it's got it's in the right mode. You know, stuff reboots in flight, right? So you want you need to be able to make sure that you know look at an electrical problem, something pokes the reset button on the Arduino because it's things flying around. Stuff does reset, so you can't assume that oh I got it going fine on flight. It's good to have this kind of code in there. Make sure stuff goes wrong. Uh, deal with unexpected errors. Oh, this is also my code. This is um, I had a it's on my thing. I had a Telet GSM GPS module, which was I hated actually, um, and it has some Python code and the Python code is reading the internal temperature on that device. And this is done through a mode interface, like AT command interface. And sometimes it would just spit back, you know, random crap basically. Um, so I actually had stuff. There was lots of test testing here, making sure that the one I got back was actually what we expected. And if it didn't, it returned this bogus value of minus 1,000. And actually, in flight, this actually happened. Uh, just spat out some crap. If you don't do this sort of thing, you can start reading around values and uh, you know, let that Air, Pro Air France flight uh, disappear into the Pacific, into the Atlantic. Um, and exceptions. This is another good one. Uh, Python has exceptions. and Make sure you've got an exception handy because if your code throws an exception, you can actually find that you're out of your Python interpreter or whatever language you're using and it's sitting there saying, I broke. And you know, you're in a balloon somewhere. So make sure you handle all exceptions. Uh, does anybody want to know what's Anyone guess what's wrong with this code? If you use logger.exception, it would give you the trace back as well. It would. Yes, it's probably not going to help me much in flight, but you're probably right. <laughs> you know, I am logging it, it's true. But what, what could go wrong with this code? Anyone? Anyone sufficiently paranoid to think about that? The logger could raise an exception. Yes, what happens if the logger raises an exception? Yes, exactly. So be paranoid as much as you can. Um, I didn't get an exception in flight. Uh, simulate things. It's a very good idea to do simulations. There's information on the wiki about using a PC as a fake GPS. Um, uh, what I had done actually was the Telet module, I wrote, they have this interface that they give you to write to. I wrote my own version, simulated the entire flight, and I could do flights on my, on my desk and make sure that things worked, including all sorts of error conditions. It's a good idea to do this. And do this, this sort of thing will get out a lot of problems in just writing the little simulator that produces you know, strings, any new strings, or whatever is a good idea. Uh, I would say simplify things as much as you can. Um, you know, it's, it's very, as soon as you see something you think, I don't really understand this, or it's complicated, try and break it up into little smaller things that you do, do understand, because otherwise the complexity will get to you. Uh, and also once you break things down into very small things, you can test them. And that's what unit testing is about. Um, break, up, break up the program into little functions to test those functions. For example, in that APRS bug, the code that did meters to feet conversion was just sort of embedded in the middle of this massive loop. Had it been taken out into a function, then it could have been tested as a separate thing and you would have seen the errors. There's lots of ways to do this. Uh, if you depend on what you're writing in, you can test for C, there's Arduino in it, or you can just write your own little program that just tries out values and gives you an answer. Uh, so for example, in that APS thing, if, if they had broken, made a function, you know, meters to feet, um, and then written some little tests, <coughs> Once they got to this, you know, they would say, well, just test every thousand meters. This would have failed here, and the bug would have been found on the ground. So you break things up into little, little units. Try not to write some massive long loop that there all sorts of stuff spaghetti in there, because it doesn't give you an opportunity to break things out and, and, and test them. And write log files. If you have some sort of um, you know, SD card or something in your flight, it's a good idea to write out logs of what's happening, so that afterwards you can figure out what the hell happened, because the debugging environment is a bit challenging if something went wrong at 30,000 meters. Um, so I would say if you've got memory, write out what you can about you know, either values you read from the GPS or the errors that were seen in flight so you can see, see the actual exception conditions and debug things. Because it can be very tricky to debug just from a, you know, a garbled telemetry stream that got transmitted. Uh, make sure you have a timestamp as well so you can figure out where that was going on. And the last thing is, um, 
do the whole test the whole damn thing. Right? So test the whole, you know, from here's my thing in the garden or wherever, with its GPS, sending data and picking it up, and getting telemetry. I actually took mine to one end of a very a reservoir that's very long. Gave it to my father in the car and stood at the other end of the radio to make sure, yeah, you know what, I can actually get telemetry, in this case five miles away. Um, get it up, decode it, and upload it onto the tracker. And I'm going to admit that I didn't do that. And on the day, somebody, I think you made the call and said, we need to change something because I've got the wrong number of fields. So I hadn't actually checked that last thing. So it's worth just doing a complete, does it actually appear there on the tracker, in the right place? I think that's it. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know whether you mentioned it. Uh, did you talk about compiler warnings? Well, okay. You yes. can do C will tell you quite a lot if you put it into pedantic mode. Yes, you should actually. I mean I, I would have warn as error. Yes. So that you if, instead of getting warnings you get errors and you can't compile less than you've got, you know. Yes, you've got everything out, especially if you're using something like C, where the cookies. Most of most of the flights aren't doing lots of sort of memory allocation and all this kind of stuff. But but if you are, you definitely want to have that sort of stuff, and you definitely want to have a framework to do with conversions between you know integers of different sizes because that stuff can really screw up. So yes, warm as error is a very good idea. After after your system test, it strikes me that you've done your system test and you're going from going from yeah, as a constant like as a as a sort. Ways of doing short test flights. Things like that, just to but test you can do it tethered if you really wanted to, right? Sorry, so you, can, you could tether it onto a balloon. Well, tether, but is tether it's going to influence the, uh, the balloon behavior. Too. Well, if you're talking about the software behavior, I mean, what you really care about is that, you know, what are the things you're trying to simulate? The probably the biggest thing is changing, um, changing GPS values. And that you can do simulating in software. So you can feed in the value, feed in values, or there's that hardware. GPS simulator that just output strings and serial port. I mean, I think that's where, to be honest, most of the errors I think that have been seen in flights have not been to do with that. They've been to do with conversions inside the software itself. So you do something and you convert it to a different value and it doesn't do the right stuff. Um, so that, that stuff is really, you can just unit test. You can write test yourself in software and see if your code does what you expect. I mean, that, that's one argument. You get Habitat to do some of the work for you. Because it's a you know so that instead of having to do these conversions yeah, on board, send the raw, not the raw data but some data down to Habitat, and yeah. which is hot fixable because it's on the ground. You know yeah. you're going to you're going to be and it adjusted, and also it's going to be tested against every single flight yeah. in some ways. Yeah. So hey, can I just one other intermediate test? I, I wish everyone would do. I've I've helped that with about 40 or 50 balloon flights in the last four or five years, and if everyone would just throw the damn thing down the stairs once. <laughs> That'd be brilliant because the number of times batteries pop out or dodgy connectors pop out or something, just a bump can, can finish you. Okay, so, I should admit that my flight did yes. that. <laughs> On landing, the batteries popped out and there was silence. So, yeah. It's yes. always a good test to drop yeah. out a window or two. Yeah. I've done that. That was a very good idea, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Right, um, so we've got one more talk left and then lunch time. Um, this talk is by Phil and Dave. They're actually at the back of the room, but you, you, you coming forward? Or, yeah, 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 we're not turning around. And um, it's about a thing that a lot of people have taken part in, which is, I think, one of the coolest things that have been developed in the last couple of years for it, which is SSDV, which is our images. And they'll tell us all about it and hopefully show us some of a demonstration of how it works if you guys want to get involved. It's something that I think people, more people should try and do because it's actually awesome. Basically, uh, and it's quite it's quite a nice idea, and it's a well, it's it's, it's a nice example of sort of slightly shoehorning a, an idea into a, a present system, and actually it working surprisingly well. Cool. I'll let you guys go. And also, we get to talk about Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's fine. He doesn't love that. Yeah. Yeah. Which one are you doing first? Are you doing? No, no, it's not. Do you do it with that second? Do you do it with that second? Do you do it with that second? Do you do it with that 
Yeah, it should work. It's just a mouse, so you just press that button Talk, so it's more than just be a series of slideshows and leave that later on. Uh, live imaging, uh, would you want to do that? Uh, if you're like me, you occasionally like to lose a payload <laughs> in the North Sea or in Yorkshire. Um, also, it's just a pretty neat thing to do. Uh, it all started back in 2010 when I was doing Project Cirrus with Jonathan Clark and the guys from Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, I I was talking to them on the NRC channel and we decided that I should do not like this obviously, a bit higher than what we were going to get, but we need to attach this to the payload and have it transmit the data on the ground. Um, nice little camera we got from the smartphone. First thought was to do SSTV, it's an analog version of SSTV. It's been around decades and it's very well supported. Except on Linux, typically. Uh, image quality can be pretty good. It's been used before. This is uh, an image from, I think, uh, James's files? Yeah, James's. Pixis. Back in the day. <laughs> Pixis 7. Is it? 7. Yeah. Uh, but on an 18 mega, which we were using, I didn't really have enough memory because you have to store the entire image. The camera that we're using, the, uh, this one here, when you're using it in the raw image mode, it will send the entire image in one go. Can't control the rate of it. So you only do that for JPEG, which you don't want to be doing because you mean you have to write a JPEG decoder on the video card. That's just going to be silly. Right. The uh, frequency shift loss would be pretty difficult. Or if you did it through FM, 10 mm is just dismal enough. Uh, honorable mention, narrowband TV. Very, very good resolution, black and white. Why would you want to do that? It's video. Actual proper video, 15 frames per second. Uh, I haven't done it yet. We'll maybe do it soon with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so the first thought after SSTV was just to take a JPEG file, transmit it on, see what happens. What could possibly go wrong with that? Well, <laughs> you might notice what's going on here. Um, the images were incomplete, and a lot of the images didn't even decode at all. So these were just some ones that did actually get. Some off. It's my favorite there. You can actually see the Atlantic. The rest of them are a bit fuzzy. Uh, this is one of Dave's images. I've removed part of the JPEG file, just taken a 256 block uh, by block and just removed it. Mm -hmm. And you can see the rest of it's just gotten very, very dark. So I've never seen it on the screen, unfortunately. 
reason being, JPEG files are made up of 16 by 16 blocks usually, not always. If you're missing any one of these, the color for each of these blocks is calculated relative to the one before it. So everything after a missing one will be completely the wrong color, and it might not even be good at all, like you saw on these ones here. The ones that didn't decode well are because of the errors <coughs> in the header of the JPEG font. All of this here describes how to decode this. This is the actual picture. It's most of the file. These bits here took up about two and a half packets in the very first version of the SSD. If any of those packets were gone, you can get any image at all. So I thought about why to get rid of that and the plan ultimately the end was just to get rid of the headers entirely. So we just transmit this on its own. No headers at all. The only bits you need, it turns out, are the resolution. And this, I'm not going to talk about that, it's more technical. All of this here stays the same on every single image, so you can store it locally in the decoder on the ground. You don't need to transmit it. Now we see. So this, all of this here replaces the header, the JPEG headers, and this is tiny, so we can transmit every single packet. The idea being that if you receive the image from any point, it has enough information to start decoding. Uh, that solves the problem of missing headers. But the other problem, back again, as you can see, some of the data here is corrupted, and there's a block here at the end because I've removed one block, the entire image has got shifted over. And so we need to send additional data. This is these two bits here. This one stores, it's a very difficult to describe. You can see how I can describe this. You can tell I've written this really well. <laughs> um, MC, uh, JPEG bit stream, the actual image bit, is sent as a stream of bits rather than bytes. So if we try and Pick a random point in the file and decode it from there, it probably won't work. Um, I'll just use a very simple table. Uh, each symbol in the JPEG file is not, like I said, it's not a fixed bit or byte length. It's not yet bits. It can be any, any length at all, up to 16 bits. So this is just a very simple table to encode the hello over and over again. And you can see. I've divided it up into bit bytes as it will be transmitted from the round to the end of the particular And if we started here, say if we lost that first byte, and it ends up here, that doesn't mean anything. If you get zero, zero, it goes to L. And I can't even remember which that is, but it's not L. And then all the rest is here will be wrong. So this in each packet will point to the first bit of the package that the decoder can continue to decode. The index, go back here, because the whole image is shifted over, it's lost track of which block it's decoding. Um, so we missed this one here. This one will take its place, but the whole thing is shifted over. The MCU index allows it to calculate where it is. So if a decoder has a packet, in the next packet it receives, the MCU index is not what it expected. It knows there's been a gap. So then we can insert fake empty blocks, essentially. And that pushes everything back up to where it should be. And then just a few checksums and bits and bobs to make sure that it decodes. The 32 bit was a very last minute addition. It was 16 bits, but in the last, there's four flights a couple of weeks ago, the SSD page received five fake packets, so it's not fake, but it's random data that looked imaging. Um, so the theory is a bit of that, and then the error correction, obviously, you need that. Um, um, so um, can't we install them tell you, can't that incorporate the checksum as well? Wasn't that actually I thought the checksum that, itself? I thought that too. In the very, very first version did that. Right. For some reason, it doesn't always. Because mm. we were dealing with, I think, should faster by bits. There's a lot more false positives than I expected to. Unless I've done it wrong. Yeah, that's interesting. 
Uh, one other thing, my page, which is not something I even thought of at the start of this, uh, because it's a digital format and it's packetized, you can have a huge array of listeners. This information can all be uploaded and compiled in one place, um, which is not a very good example, unfortunately, but it works pretty well. Uh, and most of my flights will use a couple of packets. Uh, and those have been filled in my other receivers, so it's worked pretty well. Yeah, unless it's melted by this man here. <laughs> the web page didn't handle that very well. And you know, basically, SSDB, it's a lot easier to do in the DDR controller, not analog, and you don't use much memory. Um, takes advantage of the system. system. It can be fast, it is known for being quite slow, but uh, that's really just because of the RTC library. It could be a megabit if you really wanted to do anything have a power. Camera's very light, very easy to get. Uh, it probably won't be fast because we run 10 milliwatts, unfortunately, like uh, the Australians are. Uh, the cameras are very, very expensive. The C328 is 45 quid from 50 pounds. And it's like being to lose in occasionary notions. It's not very good. And the image quality is not. But that leads us on to Dave here, who has a solution, I suppose. This is very smooth. Sorry, just follow the gag. You can't do that, there's lots of gags, and I've had to set these up for this. Yeah, that's it. Which one for next? Uh, the looks like a trick on this one, we should do it. I think you can have Yeah, yeah. Bit of work. Alright, this is the pie in the sky um, talk. Um, so it's partly about the Raspberry Pi itself and whether it's good or bad, etc. And uh, partly about the SSDB thing, what, what it gives to us. So first of all, um, I've had quite a lot of um, emails and things with people wanting to fly Raspberry Pi. And, and, and come on, which one? Okay. And see you all. Mark at the back asked me to put this because I'll get rotated so you can read it. Okay, why not? First of all, it uh, uses a lot of power. It's about 400 milliamps just for the Pi itself. Um, my typical payloads are uh, 65 milliamps, so it's about 10 times that. Um, it's quite complex. There's, uh, there's an SD card. Uh, it's got Linux on there, so there's lots of stuff going on that you, you may not want to know about. Um, LAN, there's lots of things there which a regular tracker doesn't need. And if you've got things you don't need, there's things that can go wrong. Uh, my first one, the prototype, the SD card found after I put it in the box. Uh, the webcam found after I bent the cable because there wasn't enough room in the box. So there's quite a lot to go wrong. So it's fairly fragile. It's quite large. I mean, my I haven't weighed that, but it's probably 10 times the size and weight of the mini pro and fairly heavy. And not just that being heavy, that's the battery pack, just to run this for five hours. Okay, next one. Oh. Okay. However, there are some good reasons uh, why to use it. It's got uh, two USB ports on the Model B. Um, you can put a webcam in. So I used this little thing. It's in um, hands the Pink color. Um, <laughs> uh, that's twelve pound ninety nine a PC world, and that takes quite quite a bit of images. Um, it's got the SD card on there, which you can just write to. You don't need any libraries. It's just a fine filing system. Um, plenty of process of power if you need it, though I don't for this, and uh, lots of memory. And uh, in case you can't see the board there, you've got uh, 
So uh, to you, this is the model B. They don't sell the model A yet. That comes out before Christmas, I believe. Uh, the model A actually will use about half the power, um, and it doesn't have the lag. Um, but that's kind of limited use when it's at 30 kilometers. <laughs> um, it'll have one USB port, which is enough for the webcam, um, but the power saving will be quite quite good. Um, you're supposed to power the thing through this socket at the bottom. But sockets and flies are probably not a good idea. So I wired it, uh, the power directly to the board, just uh, sold it on. Uh, HDMI, that's no use whatsoever. Um, RCA audio. You could perhaps do um, CMC through the audio, but I do not do that. Um, so Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the other thing it has on the, uh, the connector here is so it's just a uh, 0.1 pitch um, pin header with usefully, it's got SPI on there, it's got I squared C, um, it's got the 5 volt uh, power and 3.3 volt power, uh, so you can take power off of the board for GPS, um, and it's got uh, serial in and out. Unfortunately, there's only one serial port, which does make it a bit limited. But uh, actually, the, the board has more than one serial port, but you can only map one to the connector at once. It's a bit of a change. Okay, I said earlier the power is supposed to go in via um, a connector at the end. It then goes through a fuse, a thermal fuse, which limits to about one amp total, which is fine. Um, I just want to power directly to the 5 volts and MTP2. So that's, that's these two wires off here. They're soldered on, they're not going to fall off in the fight. The 5 volt line itself does very little. It goes to the USB to run the webcam or whatever you've got, and it goes to the HDMI ports, and that's it. The rest runs from either 3.3, 2.5, and there's a 1.8 volt uh, line below. And these are just linear regulators on board. All of the power goes from the 5 volt line through that regulator there. And that regulator is the hottest part of the board. Um, on the flight uh, I did with Anthony, um, it was so hot it melted plastic at the end. Quite, quite impressive. It's a, I'll put heat sink on this one, which helps. This is the uh, USB uh, ports here, and there's a fuse. That, now, this is an old port, they've changed it now. There's a fuse on each one. They're rated at 140 milliamps. Um, that webcam uses about 200. Uh, wi Fi uh, devices will use more than that. Um, and if you read the, the Pi forums, it's full of people with USB things that don't work, even keyboards and, and stuff uh, will use more than that. Um, I tried taking photos and I found small photos. Through the webcam were okay, but large ones were not because it gave the fuse time enough to heat up and reduce the voltage. So I just put um, a meter on the, the uh, 5 volt line and realized it was dropping to three and a half or something, and the webcam would just lock, lock up altogether. So on mine, those for the flight, those two fuses are just uh, shorted out. The new boards now don't have the fuses, they've been upgraded. Um, any you buy in the shops now should either have uh, no fuse whatsoever or they put a zero ohm um, uh, fuse. Okay. And these are the fuses then just next to the USB port. If they're labelled 14, that's 140 milliamps. If they're labelled 0000, then they're just uh, short circuits and you're fine. Um, that one's for the lower USB and this one's for the other. Okay, so I had this board on my desk and thought I need to do something with that. Hot flight, that sounds like a good idea. Um, now, as it runs Linux, uh, doing RTTY by just bit fiddling at 20 milliseconds to get 50, 50 votes is never going to work. Um, I wouldn't be the first person to find out that I had code that ran on the desk and then when interruption things happen, the, the, the that 20 millisecond gets banded. Uh, I think the sharp flight um, had exactly this 
rather than a multitasking operating system. Um, so to avoid that, I thought I'd just use the UART. Uh, RTTY is just RTTY 232. So the circuit, which I made on a bit of overboard, um, just has the Pi, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, transmitted signal through resistors for bias and to set the, uh, the audio bit, uh, straight to an NTX2, and just set this to 300 load, transmit the data, dump. There's no bit fiddling, it's just the UART we're doing all the time. Meanwhile, we have the GPS, but we've only got one seal board, so what can we do? Well, we only need to listen to the GPS. This is a, a lesson, so it doesn't need uh, programming, so it doesn't need to be talked to. So I just have to be coming in to there to receive, and uh, data going out through this. This is at 300 both, that's 4800. So the program just switched to 300 to do the transmission, 4800 to receive the telemetry for the position from the GPS, and then switch back in and just get switching. So one of the wonderful things about IRC is there's lots of people on there doing useful things. So I don't just mention to uh, Anthony here uh, about my board. Uh, within hours, he was typing stuff into Eagle. Within a couple of weeks, he produced this. It's, and it's basically my little circuit, but so this time it's a new box uh, QBS, and it's on a board with a pinhead at the top, and that just goes to the open cable onto the pie. And I don't know if anyone can read what it's called. <laughs> We've not flown this yet, but uh, being tested it seems to be fine. Uh, the U blocks obviously needs uh, to be put to flight mode, um, so, uh, so we've got the transmit line going to the U box and to the NTX2. Okay, to get uh, a Python run, you need to uh, have the operating system on this uh, SD card here. So, like you just download from the Raspberry Pi website, uh, you uh, copy it to an SD card, there's imaging software you can download for Windows, uh, with Linux, it's a BB command or something. Um, then you can boot it up, you can either plug it into a monitor, keyboard, and, and a mouse, or just use it as a PC. Um, but in my case, it's never seen a monitor. And you just connect the uh, SU network and then use uh, PASI or something to, to talk to it. Uh, the first thing you find if you're trying to write a program to talk to, uh, to the GPS and talk to the NTX uh, for the serial port is you can't because Linux by default has um, that port is, has a login on it. So you need to turn that off. You'll also find when the machine boots, it starts spraying out um, uh, uh, kernel messages out of your NTX2 over, over the radio system, uh, which doesn't make much sense. It's also it's 115k bytes, so you couldn't be seeing it anyway. Uh, so you need to turn those two off. That's pretty straightforward. You can I'd ask me if you're doing it, or I'll just look on the app. Um, I used the uh, Debian or Debian, whatever it's called. Uh, that doesn't work with a webcam unless uh, you patch it. The new um, uh, distribution, which is a Raspberry Pi specific one, um, does have the webcam software already built in, so no messing around. Uh, the partition system on the card is for um, a four gigabyte single partition, which is, uh, sorry, two gigabyte, which is not enough if you're storing lots of images as well. Um, so you may want to repartition to use the whole of the 8 gig or 16 or 32 gig. And last thing is to install FS Webcam, which was written by FS Phil over here. Um, I, I didn't choose that um, straight away. I tried two other programs before I heard of it. Uh, they were rubbish, and this one was very good. Honest. Find me a bit later. Okay. One quick, uh, this is just a joke, joke slide, about, think about uh, Debian, it's, um, uh, if you ask the, yeah. there we go. anything you uh, try to do in Debian that is an important thing, um, it says, 
many parts. So you have to use a command called sudo, which I think is super user do something like that. And then it says, okay. So if you're familiar with other, other Linuxes, that's different. Um, you can run sudo raspberry config, which uh, lets you um, change the partition. So you don't need to run, mess around with FDIS. I did it by hand on this one. Um, but it's just got a button because it's user. Um, also, you can turn off uh, X on the startup. You probably don't need that in the flight. Okay, I modified this after I knew what John was going to be talking about. <laughs> no, actually. Oh, I can show you that. It's okay. So basically, this is more or less the, the, the program which, uh, which I ran just up to the top level. And all it does is uh, sit in a loop forever. It really is forever because it just runs for the whole flight. And it sets 4,800 bows um, and receives enough telemetry from the, um, enough uh, position data from the GPS to know where it is, altitude, longitude, everything else. Um, closes the port, which is important because what you don't want to do is um, receive the NMA at this mode and then start sending before the port has actually finished, um, uh, finished at this speed. Well, actually, it's the other way around. If you start sending at 300 bows, so it's going dollar, dollar, and then, okay, next thing is get the GPS. Switch to 4800, you're going to get two bytes or something at 300 bows and rest at 4800. So the closed port uh, will wait for all the data that's going out to actually trundle out of the UART. So this bit here then sends the uh, position data, so it's a normal telemetry packet, and then I send four packets of SSDV one after another and then go back. So once in a while, that actually works out. It, at 300 bow, this works out that we send this about the same as a 50 bow uh, sentence. So 15, 20 seconds, something like that. We we'll send the position, four packets of SSDV, and go back again. Yeah, I'll put it on. Yes, you'd be more fun. Yeah, that's it. That's fine. That's fine. Um, because you've got pit swimming the, uh, the, the RTTY, it means um, the UART's doing it for you, so you have to set it to 7 bits or 8 bits. In this case, because we're sending binary data for the images, it has to be 8 bits. So that's this bit here. This is C, obviously, you could in Python or something. Um, one very important one is to turn off conversion. If you don't, every time your back street happens to have a line feed in it, it will get converted to character turn line feed, which for the telemetry makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, when it's the uh, 256 byte packet of uh, image data, it just makes complete mess of it. Setting both ways. Okay, so that's the, the previous one is the tracker program. Separately, I had a little uh, bash uh, shell scripts running, just taking photographs. So this is another thing to do. Um, the first thing is just to make um, make the video device, which is that webcam, accessible. And then we just run FS webcam. This resolution, uh, no banner, but it can tell you text on top. Uh, this compression and ends up as being snap zero, snap one, snap two. And it just keeps every 30 seconds, it will take a photograph uh, of a new, uh, new photograph, new file name, and go, go back home again. And just keep moving. Okay. That, that quote is actually at least 30 years old. So, so I chose this, this size. What, I could choose a large photograph to send, but we'd probably only get five or six through the whole flight. So actually smaller photographs that fit in the boat, not a bad idea. So I ended up with this combination. The average file size was 7K, took about four and a half minutes to send. Don't forget, some of the float photos will have black sky in them, that compresses really well. So the, the smaller photographs in, in the flights than you actually get um, on the ground. And we've got about 25 images, we didn't lose any apart from when your server melted. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. We even got them on the ground. We had a guy about three, three miles away, I think it was. You see them when it was on the ground in the grass. Oh, sorry. Okay, so 
unlike um, uh, unlike Phil's uh, uh, tracker, where it just took a photograph, sent it, took a photograph. My one was taking several photographs, and then by the time it was that four and a half, five minutes was up, I had nine or ten photographs. So the idea was to choose the best one, which I did simply by looking for the largest JPEG file. You could do a lot more, a uh, lot cleverer things by looking for the moon or you know certain centers of, of that sky or whatever. But uh, I wanted this to, I wanted to get this uh, flight in the air quite quickly. So I just went for the simple option. So uh, the C program then just uh, looks at the JPEGs it's got since the last time it sent one, uh, finds the largest, and then converts it. SSDV is a program which Phil wrote, so he's done all the clever bit on this program on this uh, project. I just did the simple stuff. So it takes uh, um, it does conversion. It converts this file name, which is a JPEG file, into a, a, some other file name, snap up in. Um, it inserts in the, the packets in that file the payload name, and it gives it a number. So this is the number of the image. So this n goes one, two, three, four. So then when the photos are collected on the server, it knows uh, what payload they came from and which image. So they will go one, two, three, four on screen. Okay, we've all had images like that, the camera's pointing up, it doesn't know, it takes photographs. Well. Obviously we don't want to transmit that, but then that's quite uh, quite a small file. So that will get, even in my simple uh, sense, that get rejected. So that's a moderately uh, useful one, so maybe we scored that 3 out of 10 in our program that's going to look for good images. Um, but we, we, we need to reserve 11 out of 10 for this one. Get rid of those. <laughs> <laughs> Called BBC. <coughs> right, that was my uh, prototype tracker, just a bit of overboard. Um, the heat sink, I didn't know how big a heat sink I needed. Um, actually, one the whole, whole size of the payload would have been, would have been quite good. Do you remember the Pi takes half, of, uh, half an amp? Um, these batteries here. When they're flat, that's about six volts, which is just enough to keep the power running. When they're not not flat, that's 10, 11 uh, volts. Um, the whole the power dissipation in the whole unit is about five watts, um, mainly centered around this thing. This isn't actually the one I flew, but uh, there was a piece of uh, plastic foam against the heat sink that we did apply, and it melted. Uh, the lassen, because it's embarrassed at being lassen, is over here. Out of picture. And this battery is just holding down um, a heat sink. It's just glued on to the chip. Uh, I see on eBay now you can get, you can buy heat sinks specially for it. So you can to be this is the pink payload. Oh, I do pink now. Um, two heat sinks for the five volts and the three three point three volt lines. Uh, batteries on the top. Again, this is not the one I actually flew. I changed it. This is the pie that. Uh, where the webcam and the SD card blew up. So fearing it may be to do with my dodgy twin power supply, I changed that. But we used the same box. The webcam is tidying under here, just looking through the hole in the side. So uh, you'll see later on, uh, Phil would uh, demo. So this is the uh, LFL GG running. Uh, this is the completely meaningless <coughs> to us final data. That's uh, the telemetry stream part way through. And over here, this is the image being decoded. Now, the, um, the image goes out to two, uh, in packets of 256 bytes, which are roughly this sort of shape block in there. Um, each packet says, I'm, I've got this call time, I won. Um, this is the uh, image number, so that was the number which I passed to the SSDV program for conversion. And there's the size. And you'll just see that locally uh, build up. Obviously, this is a distributed system, so even if I only get some of the image, uh, someone else will get the rest. And apart from server issues, we didn't lose anything uh, during the flight itself. Yeah. So if, I don't know how, but out of 10 images, it decided that Anthony's crotch was actually the most interesting. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this always happens. But I prefer, uh, actually, this one. I didn't see this at the time because we were in the car chasing these things to find out where it got to. Um, but obviously, all you guys at home were watching. Um, 
a nice safe picture of the thing lying in long grass next to a football field. So that, if I'd seen it, I'd have been very relaxed about that. Um, that's probably the best image. So just to give you an idea of what, what 432 by 240 at 50% gives you, you can speak with, you know, play around with that and get higher and higher. Uh, probably for my next flight, I'll just send one image when we get up high, uh, at high resolution, just to, you know, some speed. And uh, that's not bad, really. And uh, this is the images, these are the images uh, on the server coming in. Um, this is the image number, so it's uh, in hex. Okay, it's a strange order. Anyway, um, but uh, to watch this live and actually see pictures coming in of cloud, a bit more cloud, a bit more cloud, and then suddenly you know, a bit of blue sky, and then eventually blackness of space. It's really good. And now for Phil's demo. <laughs> Sorry, may I have a question meanwhile? Yes. Have you thought about uh, underclocking a Raspberry Pi? I mean, recently, oh, it's like power? Yes, yeah, I mean, recently yeah. they overclocked it the long years. Yeah, I saw the thing uh, a few days ago, they posted about that. I'll yeah. try. Um, um, uh, there are a few things. I mean, first off, there's a replacement for the overboard, it's called cardboard. <laughs> uh, this is just two little uh, switch my power supplies. The, the total power there is about two watts compared to the five before. Right. So that's a big change. Um, the model A will use about half as much as B mm -hmm. as well, so that's a lot. Um, so yeah, maybe that will get to the point something like that, which I'll try. I mean, because you're not doing off of it. No, I mean, I said earlier that um, you know, there's a lot of power there if you need it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I didn't need it. <laughs> it's just taking photographs and then that's the best one and then just sending it and that's it. Well, Phil is bringing yourself together. I mean, this is a, a payload here, basically, all that box. Oh, and that. So it's quite a heavy payload. If all you want is to do is what a tracker, then you know, use an RV then. I mean, that's my favourite one, the tracker. Ah, it's it's a, quite a lot nicer than this thing. And so it's made one even, even smaller than that. But, um, but if you want to do SSDB, it's a really good option. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, you can't. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 Um, the number 10 tends to how big is the SSD card? Uh, the, the, okay. Okay. Is there? <laughs> oh, yes, nice yeah, I know, that's what I mean. <laughs> I like number 10. Um, <laughs> the SD, SD card, I think, on this one, measure. <laughs> wow, that's 64 people. Okay, that's for the next slide, actually, where I'm going to hopefully record video. Uh, I'm waiting to get the Pi, the official Pi camera. Um, the plan is to do is to record video onto the SD card and to do um, still images from from the same camera uh, for the SSD. Um, but for that flight, it's eight gig, but actually you can just follow. Yeah, one thing, I mean, when I was seeing the SSD for SSD because this is the old analog system. Yeah. Found that web related in Linux based system basically has high read. Um, found that webcams are incredibly rubbish These are because of the power requirements and they're very costly. Yeah, so it's um yeah power power's not good. I mean yeah. so what I dropped in what I did instead with the used to Canon an old Canon camera, digital camera, they have for some reason they, they left the software on these cameras. 
which allow you to control the name of the USB port. Oh, okay. So what we did was you plugged in it as a command system, and you could just say, take a picture now, and then you put it straight off the USB screen yeah. from the camera. So you're getting high quality lenses and imaging. So then it was rubbish, because we then just de it <laughs> down to a tiny number. But if you want to do some big pictures, it might be a better idea. Because yeah, it actually, you one of my... Yeah. One of my work projects is we have uh, Canon cameras that connect to a PC, and we do exactly it's that. It's, it's yeah, yeah, it is. But, uh, but yeah, there's a, an interface where you can say um, uh, you can set aperture and yeah, shutter and everything exactly. else, take a photograph, um, and then grab it as a JPEG as, as your memory uh, of the of the uh, as a hard drive or memory device. Yeah, so that would be a good next step. Yeah. The webcam will let you down. Also, the brightness. I was actually quite impressed with yeah, it. Yours are really good, I mean, though. okay, you know, this, the first one died. Uh, the first one was the one with the pink uh, covers, but fortunately, they come off. <laughs> so I just replaced it with you know, Chalk Man 99 and Peter Wild and put, put the pink, uh, pink cover off it. Um, so I keep having it constantly happy. Um, they're not bad. I had a C920, which was about 70 quid worth of webcam, and that's quite good. But I didn't want to fly it. Also, use a lot more power. It's, um, it's got focusing inside, so that was a, yeah. it's a it, cameras. Of course, they had their own batteries. They stopped. They stopped putting them. Yeah. But if you saw my last flight, it was just a camera and, and a tracker. I, I used the batteries inside the camera to, to run it. And, yeah, no, that's, that's like I say. That was quite good, and the the um, you don't have much bandwidth, so you can only use small images. So it's good enough for that. But yeah. It's actually a pretty good demonstration of why there is an image ID number. There's a, these are both image ID zero because we had to power cycle the device out and uh, they're getting a bit mixed. The uh, new image will override. I don't know what that means. Yeah, so 300 baud. In saying that, though, it's. Uh, you run fast, don't you? It can be fast, but if it was any faster, you'd be chasing it. Yeah. 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 This is quite not a bad speed. I no, I did all my testing at 600 and then um, decided it was a bit. Um, uh, too risky that people wouldn't be able to pick that up, so switch to 300. Uh, Tim did 200. Yeah. <laughs> did he say? <laughs> don't think so. You always had good reading. When Tim was thinking it was very tight, but he had to be really on it. Yeah, it, the tuning has to be perfect. Uh, FLDG's been doing, well, not even FLDG, I know, but uh, an 817 and all around your video, and it was very, very quiet for 12 minutes. I mean, it's not much, not much bigger, to be honest. Uh, I did, with the funky dongle, manage to squeeze 2400 out of it, which is nice. But we'll never use it. Well, 600 might not be a bad option, because uh, 300, we lost absolutely nothing uh, over the conservatory in yeah, time. Yeah. We, we, when it landed, we lost a few few packets, but um, that's all. Do you have debug from the fold out direction to see how many bits you're actually Yeah, there's, um, well, there's a fixes. Oh, okay. It never uploaded that, but uh, yeah. in the future version, just to see how it's working. Does, I, I remember I tried this ages ago. I yeah. tried to get Reed Solomon working ages ago with FL Digi, and I had the problem that it was dropping bytes. If the decoder in FL Digi couldn't decode properly, it would drop the whole byte yeah. and it would screw up the whole. Decode. I had that problem at the start. Uh, there was a bit of code in this which will time the right one each byte lives. It can work out on the time how many are missing. So if you get one, nothing. So we calculate it. So uh, we probably lost one. And then we'll just put it as zero in there. Do you need a custom build of FL Digi then, or is this now? Uh, it's, it's in this here, but it's only used for the imaging at the moment. It could be used. Okay. For, it could be used so you could put that as a switch for mm -hmm. the RTTY. And then we people started to use it for a normal telemetry, and we had a problem. One person's payload would, in the loop, it would wait for the GPS to respond with the latest position and then transmit. But it would, it would transmit a call sign, then it would sleep until the GPS responded, and then it would transmit the rest. And the code put a load of zeros in, and it wouldn't pass. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So it's, it's not need, you need to fix that. <laughs> but I mean, if it were transmitting on the one continuous burst, then it would never be put. It could be an option. You could make that an option in that double digit way to enable a fixed timing or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you made it a switch, so if you want to turn it on and off, then it would be used to it. It's more complicated than which nice one. <laughs> Can I, yeah. you guys have watched any more of the talk to go, or should I suggest that? Yeah, Right, guys, we, there is lunch. Um, it's in a really just opposite here. Um, where there are various sandwiches and drinks. Um, planning to come back to a coffee class, okay, for discussion if you want to be involved in that. Are you guys going to demonstrate again if you want to come up? Yeah, yeah, I'll just have to Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but you can't have that in the most reliable digital version. It's still, yeah, 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 it's, so it's legal in Melbourne on use. So, um, 80 kilometers. Um, so it's 26 of course, it's not. Why are they using it? It's just a pretty good thing. It's been out of it. But, yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah, so I have to it's annoying, but we're looking at it. Yeah, yeah. which is better than the next Last week, we were looking at the prediction. Well, it's true. But I mean, we've got to be able to tell you anyway. I mean, I We just fly together, we, we, and also Mark had uh, reckoned that um, helium was, that was actually not almost as good as hydrogen, whereas the flights we've been doing, it seems to be kind of just, yeah, and so. it may be, there may be a chemical thing or something, but I suspect it's just hydrogen when you buy it's pure, it's not nothing, 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 whereas helium might be nothing. You guys keeping track of the room, I just realised we've got a lot of expensive stuff in the room, but not a lot. Oh, right. No, it's just across the corridor. I might just lock this door yeah. and then we have one. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, so, so, so hydrogen is 99.0%. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Unless you yeah. get yeah. real official fit, I'll put the BBC, the BBC website, I'll find it. So I'm assuming you could get it pure, but it would just be yeah, 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 more expensive, expensive than it all exactly. is. Yeah, exactly. So, anyway, so he said we should do almost as well as he did. Actually, in the end, he did. He did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it's a, but the thing is, the, the balloons are more better than anything else. So you don't, 
it had ballooned about 40 or 44 kilometers with the same yeah, parameters. Yeah, the, the so, but anyway, we thought we would go for that. We'll do a UK versus Mars. We'll put flags on our payloads and we'll launch at the same time. And we'll see who wins. <laughs> I just, and we, we, we told the register, we, we knew this was going to be up as so we flew. And uh, so he, um, I, oh, yeah, that's right, because he, um, his payload was going to be about 150 grand because he wanted to have this cut down thing which I was shown earlier. And um, mine was just a little. Track. I mean, it was actually like mine. It's a bit like a gel with a few minutes. Yeah, it's um, yeah. Anton's version, which I think called the step up. Mm -hmm. So you can run that with a, um, an IA or a AAA for a few hours. And I thought, well, fire the camera to my payload. Camera's about 125 grams. I'm going to be ballpark about the same weight as these anyway. And I thought, oh, Anton's board has got a step up on it. It can run from the two AAs in the camera. So, so the camera had two AAs and it tracked it up. <laughs> so, um, so I connected it up and set the uh, camera to second photograph in five seconds and ran it and uh, took photo photos for six hours. But the batteries were too low, the camera went high and off and turned off. We tracked the lens completely off. The tracker, meanwhile, would run from the back vault. So it could go for another three hours. So it was perfect. Six hours of photos, three hours to find the thing afterwards, even on a slow flight. So we yeah. ended it. So I put that board and flew that. So, so, so my payload was that thing with a, a parachute. It was sort of I had a lot longer line. It came kind of up for a longer line, so it swings around less. Uh, you know, not, not kind of steep angles. So my, and for some reason, the wind where he was was hardly moving. So he was, he was just going to launch by letting go. And mine was kind of full to the three angles. So anyway, so we both launched at the same. He just let go and I just tied it. And then threw it up. And we watched these two balloons go, Together, just stay together. I thought, yeah, surely. But the same, I, I, we didn't deliberately went for the same metric on both. Um, but hydrogen will be a smaller balloon, so it might be a floppier, so it's less than a Anyway, I thought they were separate, but they, watching them for minutes and minutes and minutes, they seem to be exactly together. And then people online were going, Dave, it's one balloon, isn't it? You're lying. <laughs> it's one balloon, two payloads. Because you know it's two dots yeah. exactly together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking the same thing when I was watching it. Yeah. So you've got a bit of stream between the two. No, 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 it's two couple of balloons. But uh, then eventually the hydrogen did it behind. And I thought, okay, they went up to, I, I wasn't expecting them to go together. I, mean, I wanted to set photographs, but I wasn't expecting many of these payload mm -hmm. on this balloon. But there were a few on the way up. And uh, on the way back, because we recovered these things and we brought them back um, to what Mark got to the airport, at the uh, railway station. And um, he's going, oh, I've got another one of them. A thousand meters with you know, a picture of my people in the mic. Every minute I'm driving along, and say, oh, I'd found another, oh, I found another 38 and a half kilometers. The, uh, the, the one over the Norfolk yeah. coast. Yeah, yeah so you've got uh, uh, it's a perfect, yeah. perfect picture. <laughs> you see a long way out to sea. Um, you know, so you've got North Sea, you've got some um, clouds above, you've got blackness in space, a thin line in the atmosphere. Norfolk, you know, what the fields are. Nice and down below, yeah. Yeah, and also, um, we reckon it's about 10 metres down at that point. Although it looks quite small in the picture, it does, it? Yeah. it's maybe a mile away, you know, so it's not that surprising. Um, but uh, people say, oh, well, there's two reflections, but because it's so th so large and the legs are so thin, the sunlight was bouncing off one side as a reflection and going through, bouncing off the opposite surface. Mm -hmm. So you get, so it's quite a luminescent kind of pearlescent. Yeah. Uh, picture. Whereas earlier it's kind of mapped round yeah. shape. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I saw that. Yeah, that's that was that's my shot. Yeah. Right, I'm gonna get in there because it's on the
not scary. It's almost impossible to get. Yeah, I did read the mailing list about that. It's, like, it's quite frustrating. You don't want to damage anything or property or people. So this is the thing I put. No, it's okay. I was just, uh, I was just wondering. I think, I think the problem is that George's is so much closer. Yeah, and with weather. I'm just, just, yeah, I was, just, I was just wondering whether it's going to be massively busy. But it's it's quite possible. Um, I think yeah. it'd be, the one thing is it's got those tables outside, so actually be alright. Um, I've moved back to London now, so I think I might head down to the States. Yeah, um, because. I because because cause the overground because you've moved now. Uh, I'm I live in rather high so on the overground. It's actually only three stops and it used to be. Yeah, you recovered from your weekend. Mostly. Oh, yeah. I think it was good though. Yeah, it was very successful. 
and people are upset that it's not happening again next year. Yeah, there's loads of people going, why isn't it happening yesterday? Yeah, next year, we're going to have half the time. Would it be easier to think, or is it just? It's going to be. It's going to be easier next time. But we're going to be, we're going to be bigger next time. So would it be somewhere else? It will be somewhere else. That that site was not ideal. It worked. It was good. It was good first first site, but it's, it's also like on a floodplain, so which is kind of a problematic with rain loads. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. So this is so yeah, so maybe we should do maybe if I can do a hack space um, launch. Yes, I want to do that actually. We um <clears throat> we got one of those kicks up things. Oh wow. Uh, to, which it was like three hundred quid or something. And you get a bunch of certain boarding space. And it's being launched next May. Is it going? Yeah. yeah. Where's the hardware? But, but I mean, they, they give you the hardware. There's, there's, you've got like limited. I, I still. See, basically, know. what I really want to do, I think we should do this one day as a new campaign, would be to put yeah. an NTX2 on a RCK sat or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And then so do, use our system, because it would work. Because those, um, yeah, well, that's what I kind of. The problem is, is that with right. these kicks out things, is that there's, there's like 40 of them. They've got. They're, in, they're, they're all like spring loaded in a standard cube sat. They yeah. just spit them all out. So you've got 40 of them in the same place, basically. Yeah. Um, and you've got to try and try and decode them. It's going to be interesting, especially since they've got like, I don't know, 100 milliwatts worth of transmitter power. So well, we've got a theory that it would work. As in, if you look at our balloon flights, so they're going to be at what they're like 200 kilometer altitude. So if you look at our balloon flights, we've never had a form of altitude. Yeah, that's true. It doesn't. You know, when we can, we can, we can pick up things. 600 kilometers that way, then we could definitely pick up things. Well, I got an email the other day um, from somebody who is organizing some hackerspace space thing, right? And they've got $500,000 from DARPA and why. I don't really understand, but uh, you know. I'll talk to him if money's involved. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, exactly. $500,000, hello. <laughs> they're, 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 I don't know which, we know why. Their website's a little bit kind of weird. I don't really understand why. Dark would give them. But anyway, I've had a lot of time. Um, anyway, the, the point being that if we want to track this kicks out thing, we might have to we might have to get some like massive fucking yard. Um, well, or we could just use the effort of our network. That's yeah, it. that's true. Well, if you write some software for it, pump it into Habitat. It's basically just I think it just spits out letters and more or something. It's not terribly exciting, but it's quite awesome. But yeah, no, that's something we should definitely yeah definitely um, so what I'm thinking of is, I think we, we get everyone to use their badges, and then put on the radios, and while we can't use the EMG, so the, you can't use a 434, it's only a 10 million miles, even on the ground. We're at 458, which is the telecommand frequency ISF, you don't have the radio really ones. Okay. So if everyone plugged it, got their badge, and they put a radio on board, Okay, and then they plugged into their computer. We could build a distributed uplink system. We've got our downlink system, not the uplink system. And then someone will be close up for it. It'll work. So, meaning isn't someone who just like what's well, that's the question, isn't it? 100 milliwatts. 100 milliwatts. That's all we've got. <laughs> that's all you've got. That's what's the legal limit. That would be the legal limit on the frequency we use. You don't need a license for that. There's a bit that is not my point. Up until 100 milliwatts, you would need a license. It's fine. Because it's, it's designated ISM band for telecommand, and that's the genius of this. It's actually, you're well within the rules because you actually are doing telecommand. So it's. But, but then, what's yeah. the range that you find? I don't know, we don't know. So when they launched this recently, there's basically we it's all very complicated. So on the, if you have a license an amateur radio license, so some weekends ago, Mark spoke this morning at launch, and they were able to hit him hit his payload at two hundred and fifty kilometers with five miles. 
Yeah, that's pretty good. So, but that's five watts. So that's five watts. My point is, though, that in case, if imagine you had a 30, 40 kilometer range of 100 milliwatts, if you looked at them on, a, on the map when there's loads of people on there, someone's going to go. It's possible, yeah. So that's really I mean. if you run this out. So yeah, sure. exactly. And then what we do, as you said, his, his system is really simple, you know, like, basically, what I want to do is basically use one of these IFMs to make a repeater. Because it's ISM, so we can do it the hell we want. We don't have to, you know, listen, have call signs or whatever. And basically, just have a you could have a chat, a relay chat system. So basically, all it did was, but all it did was you typed in your message and it bounced it back, switched straight back. It don't work. It's a repeater, basically, a digital repeater. And everyone at 100 milliwatts could go take it off. Well placed, a well placed antenna. You know, you'd have to run a lake cable outside. Oh, you run the, put the board outside, and you know. Yeah, that's 100 milliwatts ERP, isn't it? So yeah, 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 yeah. You can't go to a stack, that's a six stack. Yeah, it's in the theory, you can't make a game. Like. But then you have cable locks. Yeah. <laughs> and under performance. I think I think as long as you were being sent, that's yeah, it, would it, have an issue. Yeah. You know, if it's rated to if it's around the map, yeah, yeah. yeah. no one's going to get that fast. In the same way that. Uh, the quarter wave ground planes at 10 million, we put 10 million watts in those, but they have, they have a, a small gain to them as well. So we just said that you lose it in that crappy soldiering. You know, like, you know, you make it, we will. Oh, it's probably true. true. <laughs> yeah. We probably underperform a lot of time with our, with our radio. Right, can you put my agenda? Yeah, yeah. Right, can you put my agenda? <laughs> 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 To build this. That, um, so Anthony just said an example of what you can do. This is ready to go. Yeah, that's ready to roll. It's not that much more. It's a terrible recap. Power sensor is going to be mounted. It's got some step up boosts and that's going to happen. So you can run a 1.8 volts, but yeah, easy. Honestly, really, really easy. He's done the hard work for you. So my battery can So my battery is my high tech LED. It's pretty complicated. It's not going to get so much stable power side, but I can see how the next level launched. It's actually live music. Sorry? It's actually live music. It's not even yeah. solving guitar. Yeah. I'm glad that we got our talk to that way to Yeah. Oh, oh, back in the game. Health and safety for up here. Right, this one's got. That one's got uh, some headers on it. Testing. That's it. Um, Dan has got one. Dan, you and Dan, take back. Yes. He's got one without. Um, so the basic one without. Uh, point is. Yeah, and also the one with Dan's headers. So we've got uh, just a lot of other things. And I also just kind of like that. I used the uh, non lead that's it. I'm not going to You can't buy leather you can't buy the There's only three the I can do it from the other side, yeah, under the other side, it's actually a propaganda. Yeah, we should. Didn't have any. What? My concern was. Didn't have any. Need it at all times. So, 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 no, not again. <laughs> 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 
It's not going to work. It's metal. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have their stand with that screen, which is like, oh no, I'm going to get mine, except I've had to get a two up to now. Do you mean four? I think, I'm not sure what to do. It's really expensive. But really, so it's like that, it caps off the desk, it holds two, two massive screens next to each other, and you can pan and tilt and rotate, and you just push it around wherever you want, and they just switch and slide and stay in place. And it's like, I don't know mine all the time, it, keeps, it means there's no stand on the desk, so you get all your desk space back, and you can pull them to the edge as you go about, you can rotate them. I guess if I don't have it, I've never had the ability to use that. I think I would a lot, um, but so I think you have to create a full stand. Which I can afford, but with that I can buy you like two new screens. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just get a full screen stand, it'd be amazing. Um, and then you get two of them. <laughs> no, you can get a four screen mount. No, no, I mean four, three, four, three, two, four, four, three, four. Two uh, four. Usually, you can get a one. Yeah. I don't know, they've just got some of the US top seven inch LCDs now, which aren't very expensive. I'm going to say the same as Lucian. Check the box and say you can't score. I don't know which room. I don't know which room. Yeah. I don't need to know where I live. I just want to say I've given you any. For a room? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Well, I didn't get told that, I just wanted to know. I remember coming up with that. That was so long ago. I thought it was a lot of time. It was a lot of time. It was a lot of time. Thank you. Goodness. Yeah. Oh, first year was easy, wasn't it? Yeah. It didn't feel like it at the time. <laughs> they got to second year, I was like, oh, last year was second, they got to third year, I was like, oh, that's fine. Well, I gave you a it's an interesting it's a nursing and midwife. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's generally a lot of boys in nursing and midwife. There, there is one. <laughs> yeah, the male population. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm doing nursing. Hi. Yeah. That's James going to fix. I found um, a load of glider for next year. Oh, yeah. I found, I'm totally redesigning it now. I've, I found some really pretty little. So the linear servo actuators, but they're like five grams. So, so I'm thinking glider sort of this size, just long wingspan. It'd be amazing. I just want to make them really cheap so we can spam them up there and hopefully one will stick. I think so. Yeah. Uh, discussion. It's two o'clock. Exciting topic for Carlos. I can't think of it. No, I can't think of it. Oh, no, I did submit a proposal for actually the mailing list. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you can make yeah, 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 like discussing it. And then you guys can just keep going with the discussion. I'll just have to skim over the whole EMF thing. That would be pity. What are EMF things? Yeah, what are EMF things? Sorry, Jack Reeds. Let's talk about insurance. insurance. That's an interesting topic. No, let's talk about formalising UK House, because everyone has the same opinion on that. There were no, there's no contest there. Yeah. So that, that would just go very easily yeah. as a discussion. Yeah. Insurance. Good. Like, why, why were we even discussing this? That will use 300% of the available time. Insurance. Easy. Yeah.
<laughs> just have a Skype conference on it. Oh God! And just leave him going. Just keep, at least, at least you just make a troll bot with Twilio or something that joins the conference and just keeps making up the same points. Markov chain. I don't. I oh, I could. No, I made a. I made a Markov chain generator. Fed on. So I had this an IRC channel, so my fancy hat. And I went through the whole year's worth of logs and fed them into a Markov chain generator, put it onto Twilio as a phone number, and you can ring it up and it just starts spewing out words strung together from like a free length Markov chain or something. So it all, all uh, basically it's where you take the probability of the next output just based on the previous one, two, three, n order outputs. So if, if, it, if you have a, like a third order Markov chain, the three words that's already output describe, define the probability of the next word, and then you pick the most likely, and you just keep feeding through. So it just makes random sentences. Well, yeah, but because it's random sentences, but look at the previous words, they all start making sense. You get punctuation it in makes a lot right of places. By, by and it's all stuff that we say, so the vocabulary and the probability structures is based on what we've all That's grammatical sense, yeah. but yeah. no rule doesn't make sense. Yeah, there's no content, that. but the grammar <laughs> seems okay, which is really confusing, especially on the phone with speech sim, because it just keeps saying the words. Your brain can't quite pass it into meaning. But the time you get to like fifth order, it actually starts to make reasonable amounts of the sense. The problem is by the time you get to fifth or sixth order, it's basically copy-pasting whole sentences yeah. from the logs, so it looks like it makes sense, but it's still something weird. It's very entertaining to phone up. Yeah. I can't remember what else I used to it, but it was something. Oh, it could, you could text it and it would phone someone and wait for five <laughs> seconds and then go, your mum, hang up on them. <laughs> <laughs> you text at the person to put to phone. And that was brilliant. I think um, our argument about it a lot of work was avoiding. Twilio is fantastic. <laughs> I made a, a party like um, yeah, so. There's a thing where you can phone it, and it then phones all ten of our friend group, and all my friends ring, and every time they pick up, they all joined into the conference. And then it's just a conference call. It's the most confusing <laughs> thing. It's terrifying and really confusing. What's this? And it's like your phone just starts ringing. Like, Hello, and it's like ten other people on the line are going, "What's going on?" I'm so confused. <laughs> I made it do text messages instead. So you text it, and it texts the other ten people, which works a lot better. Then we burnt a hundred dollars of Twilio credit in five days, and then I shut it down. <laughs> Maybe it's not fairly cheap. It is fairly cheap. We used a lot of text messages. <laughs> it's like a cent per. And we got $100 of Twilio credit. Five days? It's not that bad. Five days. Well, you, te you text it, it sends out that text. So, yeah, that's it was very entertaining, but useful. Man, I want to send Oh, actually, Twilio is just fantastic. Use it for all sorts of things. We should maybe take yeah, some of this. Should we sit, like, wherever? I'm not really fast. Well, we can get out quick. Yeah. So, it's <laughs> Yeah, 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 that is a problem. That being said, though, you make sure things fly, which is a good skill. But, um, Oh, yeah, no, uh, 
Sorry? I'm Chris Silcox. Hello, you've exchanged a couple of emails about the It's even that that could be possible. Right. Okay. Right. John Desmond. Wait, just second. Oh, yeah. Right. Hello. We'll have time for show and tell afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, so I hope everyone talked was okay. Um, what this bit is, this is that really the next sort of hour has come about because of quite a few discussions on the mailing list, which some of you are part of, um, about important questions that have been going on in the community. Now, UCAS, just to say, is an unofficial thing. It doesn't actually exist. It only exists because we make it, you know, as in the, there's no documentation, there's no legal standing, it's just, just a, there's a wiki, and that every, you know, whoever has a look on there, you know, can get involved with what's going on. Um, and that's been how it's been, because it's sort of, it's allowed it to expand, you know, it's an unofficial thing, people can get involved, drop, come in for a while, but also don't have to be, so it's not like there's a membership fee or anything like that. Um, and the mailing list is the main way that people communicate well, apart from the IRC, but the main list is one of the, the ways that people sort of suggest things and bring up problems and discussions. Um, and over the last couple of months, there have been important discussions and big things about safety and insurance and things like that, which the problem is that being email discussions, you lose the tone of what's going on, you know, you don't know who's saying what, you don't know what, who, you know, you don't really recognise people or know what, what, where, where, they, where they're coming from. And often that results in arguments, people getting upset with each other and various things. And it got to the point where I was like, right, let's stop this. Let's talk about this face to face as a group, or at least not as a face to face, not like a, an argument, but discuss a few of the points because they are important to lots of people. And I think they're increasingly in the world that, you know, that we're doing these balloon flights in with more and more groups getting involved, they, they will become a bigger part of what's going on. Sort of gone are the days where we were a little bit carefree and we just did it and launched it and let go and sort of, you know, paid the consequences of whatever happened, you know, with more flights, increases the risks. Um, and, you know, and there are, not increased the risk, but statistically things, you know, that something's going to crop up eventually. Um, so I asked everyone to get in touch with me with some points to discuss. And not that many people have got to point, point, points to discuss. So the first, they've got, they've got two points. One about his mailing lists and the other one is about insurance. And with insurance comes a lot more. It's not just insurance, it's a big thing. Um, I think we'll start with the mailing lists. Adam, did you have any points? So Adam, Adam was going to do a proposal for mailing lists because, you know, it's perhaps outgrown this, the situation. You could say that if you want. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so I did have something with a proposal document, but I can't get it to load and it's pretty brief. Basically, I think as we stand, we've got this one big mailing list, and I don't know how many people know how it's moderated and so forth. Basically, there are four moderators. Most things, someone clicks an approve button. It works out reasonably well. But there's kind of two people using it for different things. It, I get the feeling that a lot of people are using it for launch announcements and then a bit of discussion following the launch. And there are a lot of people who are mostly interested in tracking balloons and the rest of it, which who want to receive launch announcements, but don't want a very high volume mailing list where they're getting lots of the other discussion and chatter. Uh, digests don't really work because the launch announcements are kind of time critical. Then there are a lot of people, probably most people here, who want to use it for discussion and actually saying, hey, this is our place to chat and work out what UK has is doing and have long winded rants and conversations and debates and so forth. And I think basically it would be nicer if we had a announcements list which had launch announcements and maybe things like, hey, there's a conference coming up, and the general main mailing list which was for normal chatter. And consequently we could say, right, the announcements list is just for announcements and moderate it so. 
and the main list is for all the normal chatter that goes on and we can be a little bit happier about letting people say what they want there obviously keeping it on topic and I think that's the first thing I'm going to say is I think it should be kept fairly on topic by moderators stopping people posting things which are wildly off topic and unrelated to blooming. We have the IRC which works out really well for general purpose chat and that drifts off topic occasionally and it's mostly okay. The mailing list I feel should stay generally more on topic. So that's really where I'm opening the discussion. The proposal is essentially we have an announcements list and a general discussion list and both are moderated or reviewed to keeping them on topic. I don't know how you want to yeah, the discussion. I don't know how about I mean, from just putting in my point of view, I think the way we do it is that you just start an announcement list yeah. and keep the mailing list as it is and if you, if you want to unsubscribe it. I mean, does anybody have any strong thoughts about that at all in any way? It's an open floor. I, just said, I think the plan was to move everyone who's on the current mailing list will be put on the announcements list. Okay. Um, just so that, because a lot of people sign up at the moment are just there to receive launch announcements. So everyone on the current list will be migrated over to the announcements list and then people can unsubscribe the current one, which is just for the current, just for discussion, if they don't care about it. Anybody, any other thoughts? People who are perhaps as involved, you know, in what goes on, who's on any of the mailing lists, or is that, is that okay with everyone? Should we do a vote? Is that is that the best thing to do here? Yeah, do it. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody thinks that changing the mailing list. Oh, one more thing. We yeah. will moderate the discussion list. So the way it's been moderate, moderated currently has been it's just the people who were set up at the beginning, and then I added a few people on. Most things come back to me eventually in this space. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just just to take the weight off, because you know if I'm not around, I just, one of the problems we had was people posting five or six times because their message wasn't getting through, and it's because it was being no one was there to moderate it at the time. Um, so there are four, who's it? Me, you, you John, Anthony. Yeah, John, yeah, Anthony. So, fair uh, enough. And, and we'll be very willing to, you know, it's not, it wouldn't be a, it's not a, it's not a, a collective group. It's more like if you want to be, if you want to be a moderator and get lots of emails, you're very welcome to get in touch with us and we'll add you on because, honestly. Um, one of the other things that could go with this is a moderation policy, just a short document saying here's what's allowed, here's what's not, so that the moderators can be consistent instead of having, like, if this person sees your post first, they might not let it through and this person would. But that's relatively tangential. Okay, so voting. Is that everyone's happy? Let's vote for you. Everyone, hands up for those who think that it's a good idea to change. We're going to launch an announcement list and the post. Good. All right, motion carried. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> those who didn't put their hands up, you were right. Don't be upset, please. <laughs> Try to be friendly. <laughs> right, okay, so the next thing is about insurance. Insurance, insurance, insurance. Now, just to recount what's been going on, insurance is a big thing um, and very few groups have been able to get sensible insurance <coughs> actually anyone no one's really been able to get sensible insurance um, and insurance has been from my sort of experience what's been going on this the insurance has been available which has been for some of the more established groups say like the university groups mainly because they've been made to but also it's important to, um, and they've been for particular flights or projects that have been run, rather than a sort of blanket approach, or and it's not been open to anybody else getting involved with it. And I, we have this, I think everyone can understand why that's occurred, which is that universities are going to have to protect themselves, um, and that they've got a bit more might, they've got a bit of experience behind themselves, and with the group as well, it's not like it's a single individual. But in some ways, People worry. The people, you know, members of the sort of in, in this area, in this, in this room right now, worry is that the individual is perhaps the person that really needs the insurance because they're not going to be protected by the groups that they're in or whatever. Um, now, this has been brought up a number of times, and people have really tried their hardest to find someone to insure people. You know, well, sorry, not insure people, to insure their flights. Um, and some various numbers have been bounded around people. Lots of people have taken it upon themselves to go and ask a few questions and you know email people and whatever. And the responses back have been variable um, with quotes. I can't even okay. um, Some of them reasonable quotes, others astronomical quotes. And often it's because the the it, when you sort of look at the numbers and the risks, even though they're low, the if something was to go wrong, then the outcome could be very bad. Um, and therefore, when, it get, when you look at insurance and money wise, obviously that gets taken into account. Um, I think that we should be proud of ourselves that we really have pushed forward a lot of, a lot of safety measures that have gone on here. You know, the predictor is now fairly accurate, um, you know, it can be used well, um, and it should perhaps we need to use it better than we are already. 
um, that payloads are getting lighter with more sort of things like insulation and in big barriers, things like that. But you know, inherently, as we've strived to make te these technologically better systems, we've actually also increased safety by doing that. We've got a better tracking system, so we know where things are. Um, and that's also very helpful as well. And we've also got experience with various things like flight trains and things like that, and the balloons themselves, you know, that, that gives us the information. And some also, I think you can be proud to say that we've got a few tips and tricks that we've developed about, you know, that encourage better work. You know, the launches are probably perhaps safer because people know how to handle the helium tanks. They know how to, um, to always give it a little bit more helium than you think you're going to need and things like that. So those are all good things to take away from this. I've on that. Insurance, going back to insurance. So the proposal really, and I think lots, a number of people have voiced this, and unfortunately Steve Randall, who's one of the sort of people question, which is what cost, how much an individual would be willing to pay for a single flight insurance? Now, I'm going to gather this information from you all, but um, I think it's a big part of it, which is you know, what is the chief level cost? Because a lot of these shows don't really understand this, you know, they they raise thousands of pounds, but that, you know, and that's how they really be. So that's my first sort of question to you. What do people think about? How much do people be willing to pay if they want to be insurance? Do they really have any thoughts on their own lives?
church just seems to tune out all of that talk. I don't think really that's effective to see the chat. You can put something out there, you can put a copy short. And I think if you've got, I'm not a spine card, but talking about due diligence, don't back the way to get protection. Um, then you just tend to be reckless. And then they just, in some ways, just go look for you. So you're not talking about a little bit of, of like damage and things like that. I'm just worried. I'm not trying to say we need to show us everything. But if something was to happen, that very efficient is going to do it. So, on that basis, does this change anybody's attention? Attention lose a lot if something just happens to come down there as well. Thank you. 